you have you'll have contributors from all over the world who might be employees of big tech companies like do they have the right to contribute to this code that may or may not be used for financial uh, for like commercial purposes and all these like discussions i think are kind of complicated and they're like well trodden in the like normal corporation world but i think in the nonprofit world without real entities i found it to be a little bit challenging or at least like new ground that we've been breaking it's ways. definitely new ground trust me <laughs> <laughs> yeah no, i've signed it too i kind of <laughs> <laughs> but um, but I think that more more to Andrew's um, question about what you should do, I think it depends on how you want to fund your project. I think that doing a startup, if you think about funding it like VC funding, you need to understand there is there is an expectation of you know returns and monetization, and um, so if I guess that how you're gonna get the money for me should inform your decision almost as much as like what kind of entity we want, right? Because you can have either. Right. If you can bootstrap, you, it's the same. Um, but if you are going to go after VC, obviously, if you want to go after institutional funders, then there is no question that you need a nonprofit. Like that's that's just what it is, right? Mm -hmm. And so I would I would think about who my who the people are who are most likely to fund me, and then based on that, I would also think about the structure that I, I'm more comfortable with, right? Mm -hmm. Sarah, any thoughts? I mean, I was gonna give you a third option, which was neither, which was <laughs> if, if you are thinking, um, but I mean, thinking, uh, t taking this question a step back a bit, but if you're someone who's never worked in like, uh, what I'll call public interest technology, um, and you're thinking about it, uh, I would definitely join an existing group first uh, and and get the experience basically. I mean, you could be like an incredible coder developer, like. Uh, whatever, I mean, anything, but uh, it, it is important to join groups that are kind of uh, already facing these problems and working with these problems and thinking about privacy um, and thinking about basically everything that we've talked about uh, and uh, join as a technologist there, get a sense of things, uh, work with people who are already kind of doing this work and have been doing this work for a while. And then and then call up uh, Pia or yourself, Andrew or Nathan, and ask about <laughs> legal services and clients. Awesome. Yeah. So actually maybe we should finish with that. So, I mean, uh, obviously I'm a huge fan of, of, of saying everyone should join Open Mind, but there's lots of projects out there. Do you guys have any um, kind of maybe final projects you'd like to give a shout out to um, as far as like great things for people to join if they're looking to get involved or places they can get started? Honestly, my shout out is to uh, the Open Collective because uh, they're really awesome. And I've really enjoyed working with Pia and the team there. And they, they really do incredible work. And it's really kind of an example that we should look at and, uh, and think about when we're thinking about like, open source projects and um, and privacy uh, and this type of um, basically just um, breaking traditional modes of like fu funding. Uh, Nathan, Pia, any, any uh, other projects that you'd want to sort of raise awareness of people to get involved in? Um, so I, I'm, I don't know, I'm biased. So because I can't, I can't really pick one because I just, <laughs> they're not involved in. Yeah, but, um, but, um, but yes, support anything that um, obviously OTF and the Internet Freedom Festival is um, working with. Um, I think that is obviously um, they're at the forefront of this. Um, and yeah, open mind. You have, you have. Yeah. Andrew, you have a lot of work <laughs> going on. Yeah, we, we have way more work than, uh, than we know. That you have hands. So yeah, don't be humble and ask for help. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Nathan, I know you've also been doing some, some cool stuff in the uh, 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 green tech and energy space and other, other areas as well. Any, any recommendations? Yeah, yeah, another project we support is Open Climate Fix, um, which is, uh, is London-based and has some really cool aspirations to try and bring and kind of muster all the strength of the technology ecosystem that doesn't necessarily know what the best way is to contribute on problems of climate change and um, try and corral that in a productive direction. So I think that's a really cool org. Um, obviously a big fan of Open Mind since the start. And yeah, I love to support more projects. So, you know, if anybody has some cool ideas, like very happy to hear about it. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for your time. Really, really appreciate it. Um, and uh, of course, um, uh, uh, contact in details for, for everyone here is uh, available. Uh, online and um, in Slack and by email and uh, uh, yeah so thank you all for for spending time with us today and I'll uh, I'll let you go and see you on the conference and thank you for organizing this Andrew thanks yeah. Yeah. thank you bye.
I'm Bob Rogers, the expert in residence for artificial intelligence at the University of California, San Francisco Center for Digital Health Innovation. And I'm pleased to be here to tell you about Beekeeper AI. Beekeeper AI is a privacy preserving platform for training and validating healthcare AI that we believe will accelerate the deployment of healthcare AI by a thousand X. So let me tell you why we think this is an important problem. Center for Digital Health Innovation partnered with GE to develop the world's first FDA cleared AI on a medical device. Pictured on the left, it is a suite of AI algorithms that detect emergent conditions in chest x-rays in the ICU setting. During the course of getting this product FDA cleared, we discovered that accessing data for validation and for algorithm training was a huge challenge. Before I describe that further, let me tell you who we are in this context. My co-founders at Beekeeper are Michael Blum, MD, who is executive director of the Center for Digital Health Innovation and also holds a number of other executive roles at UCSF. Rachel Calcutt, MD, who is the director of data science and advanced analytics and the program director at Smarter Health AI at the Center for Digital Health Innovation. Rachel is also a trauma surgeon and K award data science recipient. Mary Beth Chalk, who is our business development leader and a serial entrepreneur, and myself, uh, in addition to being expert in residence for AI at UCSF, I am a member of the Board of Advisors to the Harvard Institute of Applied Computational Science, and I was previously Chief Data Scientist at Intel in the Data Center Group. So why is access to data a challenge? Well, first of all, why do we need the data? If we've developed an algorithm and we want it to be cleared by the FDA or get a CE mark or even get acceptance from the medical community for its use as a real valid healthcare AI, we need data. We need a diverse data set that can handle all the different variations that can come up in real clinical practice. So we need not just one data set, not just two data sets, but a large number, perhaps as many as five, different diverse data sets from different locations to cover all the uh, diversity in patients from a biological and anatomical perspective, from a demographic perspective, um, we need to cover the diversity of different devices that could be collecting the data, and we need to cover the diversity of all the different ways that the data might be collected during the course of clinical care. When you take that all into account, it's a large number of data sets that one needs to assemble in order to validate and or train a robust healthcare AI algorithm. Well, so how hard could that be? Well, the challenges are data is protected. It's private, it's got legal protection, so it's challenging. Data is an organ organizational asset. Healthcare organizations see their data as something of value that they do not want to share and, and deteriorate the value of that asset. Patients have concerns about the use of their data. Raw data in healthcare organizations um, is sometimes not directly computable, especially if you're looking at data from different, different places, information is encoded and related differently. Finally, if you're going to do uh, validation on data sets from multiple locations and the data can't be moved, then you're going to be building bespoke computational infrastructure in a variety of different locations. So how does this play out in the real world of building AI algorithms? These projects, just the validation of an algorithm, can take 16 to 30 months. And we're seeing these projects take one and a half to two and a half million dollars, again, just to validate the algorithm. This isn't even additional optimization or training. So this is a, an expensive challenge. 
Now, to go one step further, if additional optimization is needed, so for instance, if the validation doesn't go as well as you hoped, or if you need to expand your, your access to data so that the algorithm is more robust, then we're talking about bringing in additional data, which needs to be used to train simultaneously your algorithm, which means we need secure federated training. So it's a challenge, but is it a challenge that has a big impact if we solve it? Well, we think the market is huge. Think about all the different findings in clinical diagnostics times all the different devices that are doing those findings times all the different developers who are creating algorithms to address those specific clinical use cases. It's a huge number of different uh, stakeholders. And for each one of them, if they're having to spend two and a half million dollars just to validate, it's a huge number. Estimates say 36 billion plus in healthcare AI by 2025. And at the end of the day, in order to get consistent performance, you have to have diverse clinical data inside your algorithm. So furthermore, we know that our stakeholders are asking for help because they're telling us so. Commercial entities that have developed AI want to be able to, be able to have a faster path to market with less cost. Healthcare organizations have data. They want to utilize that data. They want their data to be used to build more AI for healthcare, but they need to protect the patient privacy. Investors who are investing in the commercial organizations who are building AI algorithms need to have their investments de-risked and want to get to market faster and more uh, confidently. And then finally, principal investigators, researchers, and folks who are delivering care want to be able to optimize patient outcomes and really provide leadership in healthcare. So they need to be part of this, part of this game as well. So we believe that Beekeeper AI changes the conversation. So imagine an algorithm developer creates an algorithm, puts it in a container, and that container is then transmitted securely to a secure enclave. Think of it as a vault in which the data has been recorded. That data can be harmonized and transformed. It can be annotated. The data is in the vault. The algorithm comes to the data. The computation happens and then the resulting validation report is, is transmitted out. No data gets out. And furthermore, not only is the data protected, but the algorithm is protected from the prying eyes of anybody uh, in the data center. In other words, we've, we're, we're envisioning a zero trust environment for validating algorithms where data and algorithms are both protected. This is proprietary technology developed at UCSF in the Center for Digital Health Innovation, and which is then built upon a, found a technical foundation from some partners that we'll talk about in a moment. So we have two major work streams going on. The first is the zero trust validation work stream in which uh, we are building SGX enclaves which uh, allow secure encrypted computation in the memory space of the CPU uh, from Intel. We're using the Fortanix runtime encryption and self-defending key, uh, key management to build technology to take the algorithm, protect the data, put them together and generate the reports. And it's all running on Microsoft Azure because Azure is a uh, principal uh, cloud provider for providing SGX hardware. So this first, this first work stream, this partnership with UCSF, Intel, Fortanix, and Microsoft is building a zero trust validation uh, environment so that the algorithm and the data can be brought together for validation. When 
validation is not enough and we need to be able to do federated training on multiple data sets, then uh, we are fortunate enough to be working with Open Mind. And I want to thank the uh, leadership of Open Mind, uh, Emma Bloomkey, Andrew Trask, and Patrick Kaysen for uh, all their support and, uh, and guidance as we develop this technology. The idea is that these individual nodes that hold the data local to the, the data owner's own infrastructure can be connected through PyGrid to enable finding the data sets that you need to optimize for a particular algorithm, training simultaneously on those data sets with federated training without any sharing of data, and finally orchestrating all the activities of all the stakeholders so that we can ensure that all the activities happen in a secure way, in a timely way, and still maintain privacy. At the end of the day, algorithm developers benefit from reduced cost and, and faster time to market because they can find the data they need, they can operate on it without building bespoke infrastructure, without developing specific contracts for different uh, data owners. They can protect their algorithm IP and the platform generates the artifacts that are needed to support regulatory uh, some of the artifacts that are needed to support regulatory submissions. On the other side, data owners benefit from being able to utilize and monetize their health system data while keeping it on their own HIPAA compliant cloud, which is critical. Nobody wants their data to go off their own HIPAA compliant cloud. It allows them to accelerate their uh, clinical improvement through AI and it creates an environment where where the different data owners can participate in AI development on multiple data sets th through using these shared tools and methods, uh, which are being developed on the platform. Finally, I just want to encourage technical folks, data owners, and algorithm developers to reach out to me and Mary Beth to find out more about what we're doing, where we're going, and how you can get involved. And in the meantime, also thank you to Open Mind for inviting us to present here at this conference and for all their technical leadership and support. Um, also like to thank Intel, Microsoft, and Fortanix for their very generous support as well. Thank you.
Hello and welcome. I'm George, radiologist and AI researcher at TU Munich, Imperial College London, and a member of the Open Mind Research team. I'd like to talk to you about our projects on bringing privacy preserving deep learning to the clinical routine. I'd like to motivate this talk by the fact that AI in medical imaging has recently shown encouraging results from multinational trials showing that it can assist clinicians in tasks such as improved diagnosis and early detection of disease. This means that AI-driven diagnosis as a service tools are within reach and capable to, for example, counteract the lack of radiologists in disadvantaged areas where radiological expertise is cost prohibitive. However, considering the data requirements for training such algorithms and the way in which training data has so far been collected, namely accumulated centrally, we notice one big problem. Even with informed consent, accumulating and transmitting data impinges on a fundamental patient right, namely the right to be informed and in control of the storage, transmission, usage and deletion of one's personal data. Strict jurisdiction, at least in the EU, as well as fundamental ethical requirements of the medical profession, impose boundaries on such activities. However, in disadvantaged communities, patients may not be sufficiently informed or even able to demand the same measure of control over their confidential health data, which leads to a precarious state of inequality. Privacy-preserving machine learning provides solutions to bridge the gap between deriving insight from patient data while protecting it at the same time. In our recent article, we give an overview of privacy-enhancing techniques, such as federated learning, which relies on sending algorithms to where the data is instead of transmitting the data to where the algorithms are. This allows patients or hospitals to remain in full control of their health data and to enforce complex governance schemes which are crucial in the heterogeneous landscape of clinical records and medical imaging. Furthermore, encrypted computation systems allow for protecting both the data and the algorithms for theft or misuse in the setting of end-to-end -end encrypted services. This allows the provision of diagnosis as a service under the premise of what we call single-use accountability. That is, the notion that a good is provably used only for a singular purpose for which it was designated by its owner, for example, data only for receiving a diagnosis, but not for marketing or for research purposes. So far, Privacy-preserving machine learning in medical imaging has largely remained in the proof-of-concept stage. Our mission, both at our universities and at OpenMind, is to translate these privacy-enhancing techniques into clinical routine as soon as possible. For that reason, I'm thrilled to announce the newest member in the OpenMind open-source family of tools, which we call Premier. Premier which stands for Private Medical Imaging Analysis, is a library for federated learning and encrypted inference on medical imaging data, and it was jointly developed by organizations. Our aim is to provide the tools required for performing securely aggregated federated learning in the multi-institutional medical setting, and to be able to provide the trained algorithms in an encrypted inference scenario. Premier is designed from the ground up to be cloud ready. It builds upon the PySift and PyGrid toolchain and incorporates the current state of the art in federated learning and encrypted inference, as well as including several medical imaging specific innovations. Our design goal was for a moderately tech savvy user to never have to perform more than three steps to carry out a specific task. For example, if you are a data owner wishing to offer their data for federated training, you need to do little more than to put your data in folders, run a single command line interface call, and Premier will do the rest. This includes full support for the DICOM format and all other common imaging formats, and even for mixtures thereof, such as DICOM and JPEG. 
Running federated learning is even easier. To configure training, all the important bits are in a single configuration file. From there, you just run train.py and wait for the model to train. We also include some pre-made scripts, for example, for running hyperparameter optimization over the entire federation. From a design perspective, we chose a hub and spoke configuration, since recent evidence from medical imaging studies shows it to be superior in performance to serial training topologies and also supports asynchronous training or, for example, nodes dropping out. All model aggregations in Premier are performed with secure multi-party computation using the newly introduced function secret sharing protocol, which offers great performance and robust security guarantees. For good measure, we also had our resident model inversion genius, Dimitri, who's also holding a talk at this conference, attack the model, but all we got was random noise, so it's working pretty well. Encrypted inference is just as simple. All you need to do is set up computation nodes as crypto providers and model servers and wait for a request from the data owner. Everything is driven from the client side, including outputting the encrypted result as JSON on the client device, and everything happens under a zero-knowledge end-to-end encrypted premise. For the last part of my talk, I'd like to briefly talk you through the case study we performed using Premier. Despite the buzz around COVID-19, regular pneumonia kills nearly 1 million children each year, a substantial proportion of which are in low-income countries. Since chest x-rays are a mainstay of pneumonia diagnosis, we decided to train a federated remote diagnostic model which can help out in such low-income areas where radiologists are unavailable. Since hospital IT departments are not yet particularly keen on opening up their firewalls to federated learning workflows, we propose a new solution, which is the utilization of the recently introduced confidential computing nodes. They rely on memory encryption and are basically computer-wide trusted execution environments. We also benchmarked our model against a locally trained algorithm and against two human experts. Our model outperformed human experts on both datasets, and we found it to also perform competitively with locally trained algorithms. We also found clinicians to intuitively understand why federated learning and encryption are a good thing, and that led to high acceptance at all our institutions. We identify several key challenges for the next five years. Clinical data is heterogeneous and needs to be carefully curated. It's still challenging to fairly assess the contributions of the individual clients to the overall model. Encrypted computation is still expensive and in parts cannot be carried out in full precision. Federated learning has high input-output requirements, which we're looking to solve with smaller algorithms and efficient compression schemes. Let me close by saying that I'm only representing a large and diverse team of brilliant scientists and creators without whom this project would have never happened. I'd especially like to call out and thank Alex, our lead developer, Jonathan, Andrew, Theo and Ionicio, as well as many others from all over our organizations and open mind. Premiere will be openly available on the OpenMind GitHub in October, and we will be hosting a first look session tomorrow, which will include a Q&A and some examples. Thank you very much for watching, and see you then.
Hello, Internet friends. Thank you for spending your time with me today. And let me start off by saying this is just a brief interaction this time we've got together now. Please treat it as an invitation to speak more in the future. I'm Jim O'Leary. I run Engineering at Signal, and you can ping me to continue this conversation using jimio at signal.org. And so I was invited in today for a talk from the trenches about real world privacy deployments. There's often a lot of great academic or research material in a conference like this. However, some things that work really well in the laboratory will fall over once you introduce society to the model or deploy your software to the masses. Poor network connectivity, lost mobile devices, and complex societal contexts can make the greatest ideas fail when deployed to the world. So you might think I'm here to tell you about some cautionary tales of production deployments gone awry, but actually I'm here to tell you about some things that work very well at a global scale today, along with the principles you could take and apply to what you're working on to achieve the same global impact. The first of these is the belief that privacy is fundamental. Simple as that. And you can go very far in your system designs and organizational decisions by stating this and advertising it at the very beginning of any design decision you make. Second is that you're building software and you're deploying systems for people. And not just people, you're building for everyone. And so you need to account for differences in technical sophistication, but also culture and beliefs as well. Uh, something that makes Signal unique is our end-to-end -end encryption, where we can't analyze or recover your data. And I think that that commitment to minimizing any sort of data that's stored anywhere on any systems um, is something that you should also take and move forward with. Uh, a quick hit from the engineering side of things as you're implementing and deploying some privacy technology. Um, a nice thing to do for correctness and consistency and even just simple development speed is to write code once into libraries that are then shared across multiple systems. And lastly, while we're very protective of your data, we're very open with our technology and we feel the best way to keep your communication private is to be transparent about how we build our products. So at the heart of all this is communication and let's begin with two people. But this could also be a collection of many people, or it could even be one person talking to themselves, as I am doing right now in the smoky, dark California night here. Uh, but fundamentally, people want to communicate, and we want to enable conversation with some of the same properties you'd get if you're having a conversation face to face. When you meet your friend at the park, every word that you communicate isn't delivered through some intermediary party. Your eye movements aren't tracked throughout your discussion to increase engagement for future conversations. And nobody's eavesdropping to determine the best advertisements to run in order to influence your next luxury item purchase. We want to provide a channel of pure human connection. And so let's illustrate what that looks like here. You begin with a simple message. And since we're talking about global communication in this case, there needs to be some sort of system or infrastructure that will get the message you want to send to the person that you want to have receive it. So in this case, Bob sends his message to a chat provider or a service. Allison connects and authenticates and retrieves and sees the message that Bob had sent for her. In the era before the 2010s, uh, your message would typically hop through the internet using plain text transmission protocols to be snooped on or modified any step of the way. You could think of this as a sort of global game of telephone where one system passed along your message from its peer to the next peer until it reached the recipient that you intended for it to be delivered to. Um, as an industry, we determined that this was bad. And as a result, transport layer security, SSL, HTTPS, these all became mainstream technology and the whole planet became a little bit more private and secure as a result. But even though the connections of the server were more secure, the message still traveled through the server in plain text. So you've got transport layer security, but you've got this payload that is delivered by a secure channel and uh, decrypted and available on the server. Granted, it's a server or service that you should trust, but do you need to actually, and are there ways that we could build this better? Um, it's also been a long time since any communications platform was powered by a single server. And so when you're sending this message and it's going through a third party service, they're actually going to be a collection of front end and back end services touching, processing, maybe logging, perhaps analyzing, maybe storing the contents of your original conversation. And often if network connections were protected, as they came in from the internet, they're often unprotected within the data center. And this model of a crunchy on the outside, chewy in the middle infrastructure was prevalent uh, across many popular service providers. 
and you know some external people notice and so this little snippet here is a um, friendly note from a presentation that went public in 2013 or so about how it might be possible to snoop on data as being transmitted within data centers and SSL had been terminated um, at the external point. But even with TLS deployed inside data centers now more prevalently, still this the actual meat of the data itself will land on all these systems. And so what we want to provide is a means for people to communicate that is protected no matter the transport or the systems involved in a way that they can trust the applications responsible for the reliable delivery. So we are Signal. We're a nonprofit organization building open source privacy tools to protect free expression and enable secure global communication. We have an active collection of public code repositories. We share our source code on GitHub and keep it up to date alongside our releases. In addition to the client code that you might run on your phone or your laptop computer, we also open source our server side code as well as libraries and utilities too. Um, we wanna influence the technical industry at large, but also operate transparently so that you can um, kind of play along and participate in what we're building for everybody here. And in addition to our code, we also invest in uh, quality writing and sharing of our specifications. And so if you haven't yet used Signal today, I encourage you to go do so. Um, but you've used some of our technology almost certainly in communicating with somebody using a modern day messaging application. So every single WhatsApp message, um, along with the secure conversation modes of apps like Messenger, Skype, Google Duo, use Signal protocol for encrypted end-to-end -end messaging. As a nonprofit organization, we don't have competition in the traditional sense. We compete with insecure technology like SMS, MMS, and other plain text protocols. And we feel as if we win when the world is more private and secure. If that means um, the biggest players in tech adopting and deploying the same technology that we use to run Signal, that's a win in our eyes. And we feel noble and righteous in providing that to the community. Uh, we're funded through grants and donations from people that use the service and support our mission. So once more, we want to provide a means for people to communicate that is protected no matter the systems involved in a way that they can trust for responsible and reliable delivery. Now, I could get into some of the details of the double ratchet protocol that powers encrypted messaging for us, but I'm almost halfway through my 15 minutes here. And also, that particular development dates back to 2010 and has been running reliably in production at global scale for years. So I joined the organization last year and I'd rather spend this brief time we've got together talking about some of the things I've been more, in fact, more actively involved in developing recently. And so people send lots of messages every day, you know, billions of messages every day, but calling is really, really big too and growing on our platform, particularly amidst a time of a global pandemic. And so, you know, we are not just exchanging text to um, communicate today. I think that there's some really valuable full fidelity communication that needs to happen over an audio and video channel. And so we have calling in all of our applications now. One of the ways we did this is to harken back on this principle of writing code once. And so we've got an open source project called RingRTC that forks the WebRTC project, modifies it slightly to um, keep everything up to date from a security perspective, make some explicit privacy decisions. And then we wrap all that in Rust for memory safety and type safety, and then deploy it across all of our clients and um, use it for building out the calling features we've got today and the calling features we will have in the imminent future too. I mentioned building for people as one of the principles up front and wanna highlight some additional functionality that we deployed recently um, in the kind of uh, spirit of making sure the technology you're building can be adopted by people that might not be super sophisticated from a technical perspective. And so on Signal, your contacts live in your contact book local to your device. Um, but we're working on you know, enabling people to reach out and talk to people without having to exchange a phone number with one another. In a world in which we do this, um, it's important for you to trust who you're speaking with on the other side. And we've got some crypto backed features like safety numbers that will change when it seems as if somebody is re-registering with the number that you've got stored in your contact book already. But we want to make it such that if somebody is not in your contact list already and they're reaching out to you the, for the first time, it's evident that this is perhaps like a, a new person or a new contact and somebody should make a trust decision to um, continue to have a, a discussion with you on the signal platform.
So I run engineering here. Uh, I've got probably these like three words I'll use to describe the way that we envision our development here. Uh, they're secure, reliable, and fast. And to speak towards a thing we did, you know, uh, started about a year back and are close to deploying to production at the moment now uh, is our Signal private group system. And so from the earliest days of groups at Signal, we never know who's in a group, who's sending what, what the group is about, what the avatar is, anything like that. The initial implementation used distributed client-side state to basically make a group conversation look like a collection of one-on-one -on -one conversations such that the server doesn't know about group size, it doesn't know about any of these other things I mentioned before. Um, but one of the challenges with distributed client-side state is that it's not as fast or reliable as we'd like it to be. So we uh, did a collaborative effort with folks from Microsoft Research, as well as our own internal folks and collaborators beyond just this set here on the paper, um, so that we can kind of go back to this, uh, I guess, practice of, of open source, open protocols. And so we've got a 40 page white paper up on ePrint that describes the crypto involved here. Um, and we also open source the implementation. Again, this is also written in Rust. It wraps the specific crypto details in a layer that's implemented once for correctness and consistency across our client and server applications. But encrypted messaging is great. We want more people to use it. And nobody outside of the technically elite really cares about key size or Diffie-Hellman exchanges. Uh, people wanna use messaging in a way that they enjoy too. So over the past several months here, we've worked on features like reactions, um, view once media and stickers to make Signal a little bit more fun for people that are talking with their friends and family. And we didn't just introduce stickers though, we introduced them in a signal type fashion where even the signal packs that float around our ecosystem that we run are end to end encrypted. We don't know anything about the contents of these sticker packs. We don't know about the creators of the sticker packs. Uh, they are stored on your device locally and forwarded around as part of your conversation with your friends. Um, and so this makes signal like unique in a lot of ways that even things as you know seemingly trivial as stickers are in line with our store no data philosophy in which we don't know what's being shared uh, or distributed across the ecosystem because we feel this is your data and not our data. And Signal has always held a place in the world. Like our small organization powers a lot of private and uh, secure communications right now, but more than ever, it seems people need us and we are listening and ready to support folks as they need our help. In the US and across the world, there are movements for equality and justice, and we want people to be heard and we want people to be safe. And this phenomenon that was occurring over here in the States is that photos are being taken and shared on social media at some of these gatherings or protests. And people are then being identified by law enforcement or rogue internet investigators and identified and threatened or arrested or worse. And so we were talking to some folks that use the app and they kind of inspired us to ship a local on device only using system APIs, facial recognition and auto blurring feature in the app. And so your data doesn't go off to be analyzed and come back to the server with facial blurring. This all happens on your phone. And it's a way that we just wanna provide a convenient feature for people to protect themselves and the folks around them. And the reason we do all this, right, is that privacy is fundamental. We talked about encryption and security, but why? It's all about protecting the data. And when governments come knocking and looking for data, it's a nice sort of liberating place to come from where you don't have any data to share. It saves you from maybe difficult policy decisions or uh, regrettable partnership decisions that an organization or a uh, company might have. So, to wrap things up here and aim for hopefully squeezing this all within the 15 minutes I've been allocated, uh, you know, approach the systems that you're designing and, and running by fundamentally believing that privacy needs to be at the core of everything you build. Think about people and think about everyone. Store as little as data as possible. Encrypt everything you can and then uh, operate in the open. And I will invite you to join us in, in doing so as well too. So once more, I'm Jimmy O at signal.org. I thank you for your brief time today and look forward to conversing more in the future. Cheers, everybody.
Hey, I'm Nathan Binesh, and this talk I'm going to present on privacy and AI for startups. I'm founder and general partner of Airstreet Capital, which is a venture capital firm investing in AI first technology and life science companies. I'm also founder and managing trustee of the Rice Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization that supports open source education and research in AI for the common good. And Open Mind is one of the projects that we support. And I'm also co-author of the annual State of AI report that analyzes the most interesting trends in AI. So the question I'm going to start off with is whether privacy is the next chapter for AI for startups. And so let's consider two paradigms for machine learning and industry. The first is centralized, which is what large technology companies operate today. And decentralized is where we have a network of participants that are essentially operating in a federation. And so when we look at the question of data ownership, for centralized companies, um, data is, literally, is essentially owned by them. Users um, are essentially okay with sharing their data to a centralized provider in exchange for the application that they offer. In the decentralized setting, data is owned by each creator that's part of that federation. When it comes to model ownership, in this case, a machine learning model that maybe does photo predictions, um, in the centralized setting, that model is owned by the centralized provider that builds it and serves it through their app. In the decentralized setting, that model could be owned by every single creator. When it comes to computing infrastructure, centralized companies, of course, benefit from significant economies of scale because they serve millions or sometimes billions of users using that same infrastructure that they own and operate. Whereas in the, in the decentralized setting, the computing infrastructure is provided by every node within that federation. When it comes to private data sharing, this is generally not possible or not offered in the centralized setting. Whereas in the decentralized setting, you can offer privacy preserving sharing. And projects like OpenMind facilitate that. And lastly, when we look at the power dynamics, in the centralized setting, it's really the whales that win. It's the large companies that can amass all these resources under one roof. And then the decentralized setting, setting the power dynamics are shifted towards the long tail of many, many small participants that when summed together are worth more than the parts. So the implications for this are really that in the past or in the centralized setting, um, those who win are, are, are essentially the companies that amass all these private uh, resources together under one roof. And if we look at the decentralized setting, the real opportunity is the ability to answer questions using data that you can't see. So taking that, why would one build a privacy preserving software product in the first place? Well, one obvious reason is whether your customers would just not use or not pay for your product if it wouldn't preserve their privacy. So to illustrate this example, we can look at the smartphone market where some companies don't provide privacy guarantees over the data that's generated and stored on a user device. And other companies like Apple, the privacy front and center. And so they famously say, what happens on your iPhone stays on your iPhone. And can, many consumers will buy that device because of this, these privacy uh, guarantees. Um, another example is whether your customers just fundamentally believe that the product they use delivers a superior performance and experience because it has native privacy baked in. And so an example here is the Brave browser, which is Chrome-based, so familiar to everybody who uses Chrome, but significantly faster, offering native ad blocking, and therefore more privacy. And that company now has about 6 million daily active users. Another reason to build privacy preserving software is because the problem that you're trying to solve just wouldn't be solvable without a privacy first approach. And so the best example of this that's topical today is COVID-19 track and trace applications, where many individuals you know, in various democratic societies actually think that the privacy um, burden that's imposed by these kinds of applications is unacceptably high. And so <clears throat> if these companies and governments cannot guarantee the privacy of location data and, uh, and other related data as it relates to COVID, um, then users are unlikely to adopt these apps. An interesting uh, reason to build a privacy preserving product is 
um, in the case that it actually facilitates product distribution or uh, improves your customer acquisition strategy or even provides a brand new value proposition altogether. To illustrate this example, um, here I'm showing Erasure Pay, which is a marketplace um, for information. And so here on the demand side, um, somebody can submit a request for a unique data set that someone around the world maybe has access to. And they can provide a ward and a stake in a pseudonymous fashion and get submissions um, from, the, from the supply side. So here, privacy is really unlocking access to data that otherwise wouldn't be traded because maybe the marginal cost of trading it would be too high. And lastly, one of the areas um, that, that I think is quite interesting is um, whether the business that you're operating in a price-preserving fashion has demonstrated the better unit economics or financial performance than to operate that same business in a non-price-preserving setting. And this, I think, is just right now TBD. So taking all this together, why might you be right to choose to build a privacy by design product today? Well, the most obvious reason is that consumers are aware that their data is being captured by companies around the world. But the important thing here is that the industry in which those companies are will affect whether consumers are happy sharing their data or not. And so generally speaking, companies that are operating in healthcare or in financial services um, have less problem with the perception that they capture data than companies in technology or media and entertainment, where users are not so happy that those businesses capture data. And here I think the underlying assumption is that um, you know, people cannot be treated in hospitals if they don't share data about their condition, and people cannot get access to financial products if they don't share access about uh, data about their financial situation. Whereas you could probably consume media on the internet without necessarily telling the internet provider who you are. The second reason is that uh, GDPR has come into place and huge fines are being uh, levied on companies um, that um, are succumbing to data breaches or do not have significant transparency towards their consumers. And so fines ranging from tens to hundreds of millions of euros um, have been levied on businesses like British Airways or Marriott or Google for leaking customer data or for not being transparent towards their consumers. So while these numbers are important and maybe look high, um, they're unfortunately just a drop in the ocean when it comes to the revenues that these businesses generate every year. Another important reason for privacy by design is just the creepy factor. Many customers um, of social media products just feel like the ads are just too accurate or even not necessarily too accurate, but are actually just listening to um, conversations that they might have in their microphone when they're not actually even using the product. And so this kind of customer perception that social media products are tracking you and listening to you and using that data to personalize advertising um, is generating a kind of ambiance where consumers are not happy using these services anymore. Um, so many of them still do um, because they're just designed to be addictive. But I think it's, a, it's an interesting tailwind for why privacy by design might actually take, take hold. And then there's, of course, a regulatory reason where in Europe, GDPR and in California, CCPA mandates you to be more um, observant over how you treat customer data. And by 2018, about $8 billion was spent by companies just in terms of compliance. To draw an analogy on products that are actually working really well, being private by design, here I show you the um, inflection point in queries per million um, for DuckDuckGo, which is a private search engine. And so this search engine uh, natively um, blocks network tracking, provides encryption, and it means that you can search the internet without being tracked and without your search queries being used to target advertising. And so consumers seem to really like this, as you can see with the chart on the right. But having said all this, why might privacy by design be too early today? Well, one notion is that actually the definition of privacy um, is quite hard to cement in stone in a way that's generally applicable to everybody around the world. You know, different cultures will have different sensitivity levels for what they deem to be private or non-private. And so this kind of difference in tolerance makes it very difficult 
to design a technology product that can be used by millions of people or billions of people in the same way. And so to illustrate this point, um, I take your graph in this book called The Culture Map, which looks at how um, cultures of, different, of people from different nationalities in the workplace really differs. And so you can see that some nationalities, for example, are highly emotionally expressive and generally like to avoid confrontation, whereas other nationalities um, generally like confrontation but are emotionally un unexpressive. And so taking into account the culture and, um, and, and people's different definition and notion of privacy is an important uh, factor when building products that millions or billions of people will use. Another important reason why privacy by design might be too early is just because consumers still don't really understand their rights or data privacy regulations. And here I'm showing you a stat from a survey of about 290,000 global consumers after GDPR came into effect. And they were asked whether they feel that they have a better understanding of how customers use their data. 55% of them just said no. And this is not entirely unsurprising because companies around the world publish privacy policies that are supposed to educate users on how, how, how they process data, what kind of data they capture, um, and how long they store it. But these privacy policies are just so difficult to read, um, they're way too long. So consumers can barely even parse the information that's in them. And I really challenge you to think about the last time that you've actually read a privacy policy when you use, this, when you use a product on the internet. And so how can we expect that consumers understand privacy when they're so hard to parse? So in this chart, I'm showing you an illustration of privacy policies from different companies. Some of these are media businesses, some of them are social networks, some of them are transportation apps. And you can see that the vast majority of them are extremely hard to read and generally would require a college degree or a professional career. So how is this okay when there are billion people on the internet and not everybody has a college degree or a professional career? As a side note here, I want to give a shout out to some folks who publish a really legible privacy policy, one that's quite graphically easy to understand and grasp what data we give and what data they collect and what they collect it for. And so this is a snapshot of the privacy policy that I talk about from Juro. You can access it at Juro.com. And another reason why privacy by design might be too early is just that the technology isn't quite ready. And, um, and generally, products that have tried to build privacy preserving social networks, as an example, haven't really stuck. And so here is an excerpt from a post from Mark Zuckerberg about a year and a half ago, which described the privacy focused vision for, for social networking. And I think it's fair to say that a lot of this is still work uh, to be done. So what's happening today? So here I'm gonna walk through a couple of examples of startups um, that are using various methods for privacy preserving uh, machine learning or data processing in different sectors. The first sector that I see a lot of um, is healthcare and life sciences. So these are startups that are either using federated learning or private data sharing in order to help hospitals share um, clinical trial results or share medical analyses or share uh, data sets of medical imaging with the overall goal to deliver better patient care. And they use these kinds of privacy preserving techniques because um, one can generally not share uh, data about human health conditions without patient consent. Um, and in general, that information is very challenging to capture, very expensive to capture, and includes personal information. So if we can overall create a network where the information is shared, but not the privacy, um, the, the sort of like topics that are very important for privacy, then we can overall like deliver better patient care. The second area is with synthetic data. And so here the idea is uh, we'd like to have participants you know, help us solve a problem on data that we have. But again, we can't share that data for legal or for competitive reasons. Um, and so there's some interesting machine learning methods that can be used to synthesize uh, essentially copies of the data um, in a way that preserves the, the statistical distribution of the source data, but doesn't disclose the exact original points. 
And so ML models can be trained on the synthetic data that can then be reused on the private data from the company. And the third area is in generally speaking, enterprise software for privacy components or compliance, which provides sort of out of the box compliance um, uh, sort of products that businesses can use in order to be compliant or to offer better privacy guarantees to their users. So these kinds of products are really useful um, to help overall level the sort of level the playing field or increase the level of privacy across the entire network of software companies. And so to conclude, I think the real opportunity here is, is twofold. Um, the first is this idea of federated data, which is really about unlocking data that harbors untapped signal. And the next step from that is this idea of federated intelligence, which is taking all this data that was previously locked up or not able to be shared for a variety of reasons, using privacy preserving methods to unlock that data and aggregate all of it into a common experience set that can be shared with all the participants in order to level up um, their experience. So here you can take the example of fighting cybercrime, where many different businesses face cybercrime every day, but they don't necessarily want to disclose the fact that they're, um, um, that they're experiencing cybercrime because that's bad for their reputation or, or various other reasons. Um, but all businesses that are susceptible to cybercrime would benefit from understanding their trends across, um, across their peers. And so using federated data and federated intelligence can um, essentially provide a way that uh, preserves privacy, but that exposes this kind of aggregate experience to all participants. And the key thing I want to leave you with is that you should not forget that taking a product and adding privacy is just not enough. And there have been many examples in the past that show the only way to replace incumbents is by beating them by a very, very wide margin. And so take an example here um, from a completely different segment, but one that's very much the David and Goliath battle that I talk about um, is Mission Barnes, which is a airstreet portfolio company um, that's essentially invented a new way to make meat um, that does not involve slaughtering animals. Um, and so this is in the segment of clean meat, cell-based meat, and what's, what's amazing here is that they've actually developed a product that has essentially taste and, and, um, and texture parity with bacon, but provides a number of benefits over real bacon, which is no foodborne illnesses, no toxic contaminants, no trans fats, no antibiotics, and no slaughtered animals. And so this is a way that you can actually replace an incumbent, provide the same product, but 10x better. So if you'd like to learn more about some of the work that we do and the events that we run and content that we share, I encourage you to head to rise.co, which is our research and applied AI summit, which in the past has hosted a variety of talks on privacy preserving machine learning, federated learning, which you can find on YouTube. Uh, we share a variety of learnings on building AI for startups on our blog, which is airstreet.com forward slash blog, and a variety of other resources at guide2.ai. Of course, I'd love to chat to you and discuss research and startups and anything else that's on your mind. You can reach me on Twitter at Nathan Benej and on Telegram at Airstreet. So with that, thanks very much for listening and look forward to meeting you at the conference.
Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Today, Jackson Austin and I will be discussing the data privacy investment landscape. So I'm Morgan, I'll start us off. I work at NQTEL, which is the nonprofit strategic investor supporting the US intelligence and national security community. Jackson represents Salesforce Ventures and Austin represents Okta Ventures. Each of them will give a more in-depth intro as they launch into their slides later in the presentation. So kicking us off with this figure from Crunchbase, which shows the amount invested in privacy and security companies broken down by stage over the last 10 years. So here we can see close to $10 billion was invested in these companies in 2019. The takeaway here is that the market is becoming increasingly important for consumers and enterprises alike, the data privacy and security market. So here in our next slide, we launch into the high level regulatory landscape and a sampling and overview of startup activity which within each of these regions. So we'll start with Europe. GDPR, or the General Data Protection Regulation, was rolled out in May 2018. It addresses the transfer of personal data inside and outside of the European Union. It was a really important and far-reaching regulation. And in terms of startup activity, Europe has a lot going on. Germany, specifically, seems to be a hub of data privacy activity, likely due to a high concentration of research universities in the country. Moving over to the US. So the US has no overarching federal data privacy law, but it has lots of industry specific protections like HIPAA for healthcare and the California Consumer Privacy Act, which helps enhance privacy rights for consumer protections for residents of California. And CCPA, the act that I just mentioned, went into effect in January 2020. Similar to Europe, the US has a ton of startup act startup activity and is home to key researchers and key research institutions in the data privacy space. So Harvard, Penn, and a few other institutions are really innovators in data privacy. Lastly, we have this bucket for what we just call rest of world, and I'll touch on a few specific geographies. There's a lot going on in data protection as different countries and consumers themselves are realizing how important data privacy is. So first we'll touch on Brazil. Brazil's regulation is called the General Data Protection Law. It's very similar to GDPR and this was passed in August 2018. It focuses on personal data protection. In Canada, like in Europe, there is strong federal legislation in the data privacy space. Canada's main regulation is called the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act. <laughs> so this is key in Canada and covers how businesses handle personal information. And in terms of startup activity, it's pretty modest. Um, China also has some privacy laws. The key one to know is China's cybersecurity law, which went into effect in June 2017. The law is the baseline for China's present day guidelines. Great. So moving on to the next slide, I just wanted to level set by talking through some of the privacy preserving technologies that exist in research and on the market today. So many of the startups on the previous slide are working with one, of, one or more of these methods to develop their products and their technologies. All of these approaches suit slightly different use cases and have slightly different drawbacks and limitations. So the key takeaway here is that there's often no good answer when it, no one good answer when it comes to privacy protection. Sometimes you'll have to use different tools um, and different implementations based on what method suits your use case. So quickly, just to go through all of these, homomorphic encryption, we had Onveil on the previous slide, which is a company in this space. So homomorphic encryption enables compute on data without decryption. So what that means is it's able to keep information secure and accessible for purpose for analytic purposes. Um, so for example, if you wanted to analyze medical records but ensure that data was not leaked, you could use homomorphic encryption. The limitation here is that it ha it is slow with regard to computation time, though computation time is improving. Um, so another technique that has a similar limitation, secure multi-party computation, which is just below, can also be computationally intensive. Um, so what it does, it is it enables joint computation of a function, but it keeps the inputs private. So a use case here is aggregating data from many different sources while protecting the privacy of each different source. 
So we'll go back across the top here and look about look at differential privacy. This is a really interesting technique that provides anonymization with guarantees. Differential privacy uses an epsilon value that determines how strict privacy is. So I wanted to dive into a little bit deeper of an example here, um, and we'll take the 2020 census. So differential privacy is actually being used as a privacy-preserving measure in the 2020 census. The Census Bureau has a requirement to ensure that data from individuals and households remain confidential. So for the census this year, it plans to use differential privacy for disclosure avoidance. Basically how it will work is some noise will be injected into the data to minimize risk of identity disclosure, but also preserve the potential for downstream calculations. So moving to federated learning, this is a distributed machine learning approach. You can train your models using decentralized data that reside on different end devices, such as cell phones. The use case is, in the case of cell phones, you can take them at different locations and they can, in a collaborative fashion, learn a machine learning model while keeping all personal data on device. Finally, I want to move down to synthetic data. So synthetic data is generated data that can be used in a number of different applications, but specifically for the purposes of this presentation, in a privacy preserving context, users can generate training data where there is a limited amount of raw data. And in machine learning, for example, synthetic data can produce meaningful results for building and training privacy preserving models. So lots of exciting things happening in this space. As you can see, this was just intended to be a brief overview I'm going to turn it over to Jackson, who can talk a little bit more about enterprise applications and one of his portfolio companies that's actually using synthetic data. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Morgan. As, as you mentioned, my name is Jackson Cummings, and I'm an investor at Salesforce Ventures, which is Salesforce's strategic corporate venture fund. And our core focus is investing in leading enterprise software businesses globally. We've been investing for more than 10 years and have north of 250 active portfolio companies. And want to give a little bit of insights as to why privacy matters into the enterprise. And I think one thing to keep in mind is that now more than ever, enterprises are really paying attention to data privacy and these various regulations that Morgan mentioned. And part of that is the scope of these regulations is massive. More than 1 billion people today globally are now free to exercise their subject rights at no cost to them. This affects both consumer businesses as well as B2B enterprises collecting the sensitive information. As we move down into some of the key trends that we're hearing from our end customers, we spend a lot of time talking to folks in the space and customers, companies, and to pinpoint what these key trends and pain points that they're seeing within their own organizations. And one of the key trends we're seeing is that this is becoming more and more important to C-suites and that data privacy is no longer siloed with the security or IT teams inside of these companies. Due to data breaches and fines, the level of importance has escalated to the entire C-suite. We are seeing trends that every C-level individual, including the CMO and the, and the chief product officer, need to understand the ramifications of data privacy and how it affects their organizations. We do recognize that budgets have been constrained in the near term, primarily due to COVID-19, but in the long term, our view is that, and what we have heard is that budgets related to data privacy will increase. Another key theme here is that customer is king. Customers remain important for every business and a data breach will negatively impact the relationship that these enterprises have with their customers. Every data breach, including some of the high profile cases that we've seen from Equifax and from Facebook, are proving negatively impactful for these companies and run the risk of losing trust with their end customers as well as brand appeal with their customer bases. Another key theme here is that fines from these regulations are increasing. So since GDPR was issued roughly 24 months ago, regulatory bodies have been gradually getting more harsh on companies, especially those that have not proven an effort to become compliant. The risk associated here in a class action lawsuit are continuing to increase and we're seeing these fines um, be more and more imperative to companies today. 
Now, touching on a couple of the applications that are solving some of these pain points um, below are, and as I mentioned here at Salesforce Ventures, you know, we have made a number of investments in the space. And these are a few of our portfolio companies that are within the data privacy realm. Wanted to highlight just a couple here. And firstly, Big ID is a market leading data discovery and mapping organization that is focused on surfacing PII for both unstructured as well as structured data within an organization's network. They allow an organization to map out where they have vulnerabilities and help them stay compliant, among a number of other things. Another company to highlight here is Privatar, and they've built an industry-leading product allowing organizations to use, share, and derive insights from data safely. To touch on, this is the company that Morgan highlighted earlier when she mentioned synthetic data. So they use synthetic data to generate dates, numbers, text, and even credit card numbers to, to generate this additional data to use. They're also able to tokenize and de-identify this data, especially, as it's, especially when it's data associated with PII. So introduced in here, there's just a, these are just a few solutions that enterprises are using to better tackle these pain points that they're facing related to data privacy. And now I want to kick it over to Austin to talk you through some of the trends he's seeing from the consumer. Thanks, Jackson. Um, as we saw in the previous two uh, sections of this presentation, you know, Morgan helped establish a lot of the government regulations and technology drivers that are sparking interest among VCs. And Jackson talked about how the enterprise is particularly interested in solving for uh, numerous problems uh, that are both you know, spurred by regulation and also specific needs within companies. And I want to talk a little bit about some of the consumer drive um, that's happening right now uh, and how the sentiment has changed over the past 10 years towards more uh, privacy preserving technologies and consumer use cases. So if we just take a little bit of a chronological look uh, at some of the key marquee technologies that have happened in consumer over the past few years, we really saw the advent of social media and social networks launch with Facebook. And at the time when it was first adopted, we started to see a lot of people sharing different posts and social media posts widely to the public. And over time, obviously, people started to realize that they wanted to have additional settings to perhaps just post the social media uh, excerpt or picture to a particular person or a group. And really, a few years after some of those privacy uh, settings were enabled on Facebook, we started to see uh, a lot of interest in the messaging platforms. This coincided obviously with the, the advent of the iPhone um, and, and, and really the rise of, of mobile devices amongst consumers uh, that were internet enabled. And that's really when we started to see WhatsApp um, begin its, its inexorable rise. And obviously Facebook acquired WhatsApp um, and largely, you know, uh, the perspective that I'd like to share here is we think that's really a drive towards moving away from a public persona of using social media towards more of a closed enclosed environment where you can share information, pictures, and messaging with your groups. Um, that also led, you know, around the time of when Snap was established to this idea of ephemeral messaging. So sending a message that can disappear. Um, and it's no surprise that, you know, some of the younger folks, people in their teens that are doing maybe uh, different activities with their friends, that they are actually the first people that really want to have a chance to have that privacy preserving technology. And that really led to other tools like Signal and Telegram and even smaller communities like Keybase that were from an encryption technology standpoint much more enhanced than other social networks that we've seen in the past. Obviously, Zoom just acquired Keybase recently and was really a good symbol of a large enterprise company looking towards consumer technology uh, as a way to innovate and improve its encryption and privacy preserving technology uh, for its user base. And now there's even newer companies that are coming online right now. Planetary is an example of an early, early startup, um, which is building a social network from the ground up with privacy preservation as a core founding principle. So over time, we've really seen two major strains. We've seen a move from more public distribution of information from the consumer to an interest to closing towards specific groups. And we're also seeing enterprise companies finding inspiration from some of these consumer technologies 
um, really around tools of encryption and, and privacy uh, uh, mechanisms. So with that, we wanted to transfer, uh, you know, the, the organizers of Open Mind asked us if we could provide a kind of crystal ball slide at the end of this presentation. And so each of us have derived a, a, a specific uh, recommendation or, or prediction, I should say. Um, and so I'll hand it off to Morgan. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you think the future holds or what the future holds for, for this industry. Definitely. Thanks, Austin. Um, so here I just wanted to share, I think the privacy by design paradigm is becoming increasingly important and open mind definitely plays a huge role in that as privacy tools are becoming, are made available open source and developers continue to build privacy into their products from the first step in the development life, life cycle. So I think that paradigm will become increasingly important as we move forward and I'll turn it over to Jackson to share his recommendation. Yeah, thanks, Morgan, and, and thanks, Austin, here. Um, I guess in terms of the crystal ball here, I, I guess enterprises and consumer spaces alike are seeing privacy innovation. That's no real big surprises, but at the end of the day, the space was not well-defined and is, not part, is now part of the enterprise tech stack, meaning this is a C-level decision and there are big budgets and big corporate governance associated with this specific space. And I think another thing to highlight, if we take a look at some of our portfolio companies and most of the companies that are being created here in the space, none of them really existed 10 years ago. Uh, and these are companies that are now big and, and raising a ton of funding. And we do feel that this is just the first inning and where data privacy is gonna go. So in terms of, you know, kind of the next generation, we still think that there's a lot of innovation to be had and a lot of corporate budgets that are looking to push into the space. And with that, I will shoot it over to Austin. Yeah, thanks, Jackson. Um, you know, I, I would say that in consumer, what we're seeing is, a, is, is really a trend towards valuing privacy in, the, in a way that hasn't been done in the past. Uh, again, historically, the advent of social media and social networks really brought on this idea of sharing your posts publicly, of creating a very wide following. But we've begun to see a real emergence of messaging platforms, uh, very uh, sophisticated encryption technologies being utilized for those messaging platforms that can be particularly useful when talking about sensitive topics. And these hardcore technologies are now being adopted in the consumer sphere. And it really is interesting to see the rise of consumers thinking about their security almost like an enterprise security company. Um, and so that, that's been a really exciting area to, to look at. And I think we're just gonna see a lot more of that as the sophistication of the consumer grows over time. So with that, we just wanted to uh, offer the chance for you all to ask anything. We have recorded this presentation, um, but uh, we will be available um, to actually answer your questions uh, when this is posted live. So thank you all very much. Really appreciate it.
Well, welcome to the Open Mind Privacy Conference session on uh, privacy AI and startups. Uh, today, um, uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, Michael Gear, uh, co-founder of Humanity and also member of Open Mind. Uh, Theo Rafael, uh, who's actually the Open Mind uh, team lead on cryptography at Open Mind, as well as um, a co-founder of Arkin. Uh, my name is Sachin Deshpande. I lead technology marketing, and um, I'm working with uh, big tech partnerships at Open Mind. Um, and I just thought uh, we would start off uh, before we get into any of the topics, just with some quick uh, around the horn introductions. Um, you know, Teo, who's basking in the Parisian sun there in that uh, beautiful <laughs> sunlight. Uh, do you mind uh, giving a little bit of background uh, on, on yourself, uh, your company, and, and your role at OpenMind? Yeah, sure. So, um, so hi, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to, to, to be here. Uh, so, um, as, um, as you said, I'm a cryptography team lead. So, um, we're trying um, within OpenMind to uh, develop, integrate, implement a new cryptography algorithm. To, um, to provide new way to do fast and secure uh, machine learning. And also, so I'm co-founder of Arcan. Arcan is a young company based in Paris. Um, we help hospitals to better manage uh, the healthcare data to improve uh, patient care. So concretely, like in a sentence, we build a centralized and standardized uh, data lake on premise. Uh, to have uh, to have patient information retrieval for like practitioner or, or, or um, labs and stuff like this. Thanks, Teo. Um, and uh, Michael, I'd love to for you to describe your background as well as uh, describe what you're doing with uh, humanity. Sure. Yeah, and, and thanks for having me on here. And uh, yeah, great to be involved with Open Mind. Uh, yeah, my background. Well, wanted to be an astronaut, but uh, eventually. <laughs> created a dating site out of Moscow uh, called Badu that got quite large, but then uh, moved on to uh, get quite involved with uh, privacy and security and, and protecting the internet uh, and ended up running the largest uh, consumer VPN in the world. Um, and, but in the course of that got quite uh, into preventive health uh, and was affected by some, you know, tragic health events with people that were close to me and really started going down the rabbit hole of, figuring out what we could do to stay healthy for longer. Uh, and in the course of that, and as you know, Teo knows well, uh, you know, there's a lot of data out there uh, that can be used to actually save lives and, and make ourselves healthier. And uh, so kind of came across open minds and a lot of different technologies that allow us to leverage that data uh, for good, uh, but keep the privacy of the user. So that's, uh, that's why I'm here uh, talking with you guys today. Thanks, Michael. Uh, my name is Sachin Deshpande. I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm focused on technology marketing and big tech partnerships at uh, at Open Mind. And uh, I, you know, I have a, a combination of big tech and startup work uh, uh, from my past uh, with with Facebook, um, you know, Qualcomm, uh, even Zoom, and as well as some as some startups. And and really, what the the reason I got or or the way I got involved with Open Mind was I saw a talk that he did uh, at MIT. I saw it on YouTube. Uh, he did for Lex Fridman. And um, I really thought Open Mind's vision uh, towards both the protection of data as well as the unleashing of data, um, you know, to enable data sets for, for, for better, you know, social purposes was, was really mind blowing. And uh, I just wanted to pitch in. Uh, you know, any way I could. So it's been, it's kind of been a privilege for me to meet the great people such as Teo and such as Michael through this incredible community. And really what Teo and Michael and I were talking about was, uh, want to talk about today is, I think Michael and Teo are uniquely suited to do this, is, um, you know, how open source communities such as Open Mind, but in particular Open Mind, um, and, and startups can, can coexist and, and frankly, synergistically benefit each other. And we just thought we'd just spend, you know, the next few minutes, um, you know, talking about that. Um, so, you know, the, the obvious question and, you know, Tao, I'm going to start with you. Um, you've been working with Open Mind for a while and you've been working um, with Arkin for a while. Um, what's it like doing both? Um, what are the points of synergy uh, where you guys work together, the value exchange and, you know, um, just just at a high level, we'll talk about the 
specific privacy technical constructs later, but I'm just kind of curious, uh, what have been the, uh, the, the, the benefits and maybe even some of the challenges? Yeah, sure. So um, first, w one thing about like uh, my implication in open mind in Arkan is that they are both like very, um, uh, you know, it's like the two, two um, face of like of a coin. So on the one hand, we need to make the data available, clean to be able to run like data analysis uh, in, a, in, in an efficient way. And on the other, on the other side, we need also some uh, some cool and, and, and robust libraries to uh, to be able to uh, uh, just to ship some models, train them, and and, and uh, try to uh, try to uh, to improve uh, our knowledge in 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 healthcare. So uh, this works really like together. And as we as at Arcan, we what we do is, as I said, is we build crucial infrastructure in the hospital uh, to um, where we, we care a lot about. Uh, privacy security of the data because we put all the data at the same place so obviously we need to be very careful so um, the structure that we build the code that we build is very sensitive therefore it was natural for us to make it open source so also we have been open source um, since the beginning so hmm. open source was something which is really really uh, natural so that's why like working with open mind is is also something that that we have been uh, always uh, keen to do and uh, we have like build several products together and now currently we are working on a project uh, um, to uh, develop the different privacy part uh, in open mind and uh, i think uh, lucille from Arcan is doing a talk at the at the conference uh, on this um, but uh, between the interaction what i say is like we we take a lot of what is built in the community uh, and we also we give a lot like we we give mm -hmm. our use cases we give like sometimes we have like people from the company which works on on, on this uh, community project to um, build new, new stuff and um, and it's also a way to, uh, to learn about like what is going on on these topics it's a very advanced topic yeah. about privacy uh, cryptography everything is going really fast uh, having access to a community uh, of researchers helps a lot to you know okay what are the latest uh the latest advance and uh and the other thing is also like we have we have discovered great talents um as part of the community that now works uh at Arkan. so uh, like we are really excited about this um maybe like, for the last part of your question which is like what are the challenges uh yeah. the challenges is that of course it requires like efforts like you cannot just put your code open source and say okay I, i'm gonna build a community out of this it doesn't work uh, you need to engage to um, help contributors understand uh, how you will help them to build something that is cool that will be like uh, helpful for them, and and this takes a lot of time. That and I'm sure Andrew can can, can tell like at the time you spent the beginning just explaining why yeah. why we had to do this, why we had to engage in the community. So like that's the big challenge also. No, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, you know, the time that you have to put in to get those benefits. I was just curious, just one quick follow-up question, Teo. Um, the advantages are very, very clear uh, that you were talking about the community, staying up on, on, on top of everything, you know, the meeting of the great minds and potential talent. And, and obviously, um, I understand the challenge there of, of some of the infrastructure work. Are there any, um, and I have to ask this as an XVC, are there any competitive disadvantages? by yeah sometimes if you put some of your advanced stuff back in open source and i know it's a tricky tricky thing so uh, that's like what i saw a, a question um i was discussing with my co-founder which was like maybe not uh, as experienced as otherwise in open source uh, but um you know what i would say is uh, when you're building complex stuff uh you'd better build it together like uh, together with mm. the community like maybe some stuff that I can contribute it will be used by uh, by another company, uh, which could be like a competitor. But uh, I mean, this means that um, uh, they are following us. So uh, I mean, this yeah. means that we are we are leading the good direction. So that's very positive, and and we have definitely a better understanding of the code base of the roadmap of where yes. we want to go. So so uh, I have like my code in the community, which is being maintained updated upgraded yeah. uh, almost for free um, and uh, even maybe updated by my competitors so um, right I mean like there is a trade-off but uh, the trade-off is positive for me 
I think that's, that's very, very clear. Um, thanks, Teo. Michael, uh, why don't you explain to, um, to everyone uh, what, uh, a little bit about your background and, and in particular, um, you and I have spoken about humanity, which I, I find t totally fascinating as well. Um, we'd just love to hear about it, both things. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, it, we both kind of, you know, me and Pete, Pete Ward, my uh, co-founder, we both came to it, as I said, kind of, you know, through experiences that we had with, uh, you know, tragic kind of health events that drove us in that direction. I, I think the kind of aha moments where we were like, oh, there's something actually that isn't getting out to people now that needs to. And, and when we started going around and talking to a bunch of scientists and there were disparate fields, geneticists uh, who actually have some experience with kind of bigger data sets and you know, immunologists and stem cell researchers, the aha moment was that you could actually monitor. So we were thinking like early detection of disease so like early detection of cancer was the one that I was really interested in. Uh, but when we were talking to all these people, actually what there was was this idea that you're actually always progressing towards disease. And so on the spectrum, and you could actually get people much, you know, it's, it's basically what preventive health is all about. You can get people way before they get to the, you know, quote unquote disease state. Uh, and when we started looking at that, the, the, that was the first aha moment, but the second one that finally said, oh, there's, there's something we can do and we can bring to people is the idea that you have these longitudinal data sets, these big data sets, and you actually, and within those data sets, you actually see the health events that happen to a large group of people. So this person had a heart attack, this person had, you know, got, you know, cancer diagnosis, and you can see all their biomarkers. So these amazing data sets where then you can get predictive algorithms to actually mm. predict how far away people are from disease. And when, okay, so those are the two aha moments. Then the, the third one was, okay, but we really need to somehow then unleash this data in a way that this is very, very private data and it needs to stay that way. How can we actually unleash it and leverage it? Because there's millions of lives to be saved if we do this correctly, not, not just us, but everybody, right? Uh, and so that's when I was talking with one of our uh, investors who uh, did a big AI company that Facebook bought, and he sent me a video of Andrew. And, and I think I told you this, Sachin, it was like one of those you, things. You did. Stuff. And I, I didn't watch it for like three weeks. It was just like, yeah, thanks for the video yeah. <laughs> on the list of the other 20. Uh, and then I watched it and I was like, oh, that's exactly what we were like thinking, right? Like he, I think Andrew gave an example of, you know, you know, raise your hand. He was in a group of, you know, ML and Python developers and, and uh, PySift. And, uh, you know, it's like, raise your hand if you've worked on kind of like a predictive text, you know, data set. Ra you know, ra yeah. raise your hand if you've worked on a, a diabetes data set. And everybody said, no, no, no. no. <laughs> and it was like, well, okay, well, which is more important, do you think? And everybody's like, oh, well, the health ones are more important. And he's like, okay, well, we should do something about that, right? I think it was just a, a great way to frame it. Uh, and so in that idea that everybody in that audience, they're not, they're not special, you know, they're not, you know, Stanford professor or something like that. Those are people that learned how to code and that they know how to do ML. And if we could unleash those millions of people around the world that are learning these skills, you know, the impact is, is way more than any, any one of us in any company. But so that was, that was the aha of the whole thing. But with humanity, what we want to do is harness that and actually bring it because we, we make, We've made apps that got to a billion people, me and Pete, uh, and we want to bring that directly to the consumer where they can just, and, and we have some test users already in the UK using, you know, the alpha, where you can actually, you get all your data, you pull it in, we run it through the algorithms, and you actually can see your probability of disease. We put it as a rate of aging, uh, and that's your, mm. that's your feedback loop. Mm. Now you can base everything you do, anything you're trying to be healthy, you can now see, is it working or not against that predictive algorithm? Uh, and then obviously as you kind of expand that and we partner and we open up our data set as in allowing people to train on it, but not getting access to the data. Uh, I think there's just a ton of good that can come from that. And so that's, that's why we're, uh, although as a startup, we have so many other, you know, we have so many priorities and we need to, you know, you know, n make it to the next VC round and all that kind of stuff. No uh, question. Pete and I have built and sold a couple companies now and you know, what else is there other than impact? Uh, and so what we, even in this early stage, what we're thinking early is like, how do we actually get to that massive impact point, which is 
us getting us the app humanity getting to 100 million people and more but more importantly how do we how do we raise all ships that we all kind of move forward and and, and get to this point of impact so no that, that, that's an uh, incredible vision for humanity i'm excited about it and uh for, for all the betas that are coming up and uh, uh i one one question i have for you is given your depth of experience and and and, and putting um consumer apps into the, you know, into the billions. Uh, when you saw Andrew's talk and when you thought about open source, what are your views? I mean, the same thing I kind of asked Teo, um, you know, the, the, the pros and cons of, uh, of, of, of really working with open source, source communities. Just, just any, any, any thoughts that you had, you know, maybe before you started working with Open Mind and after, yeah. Sure. Yeah, and, and you know we, we've explored this and we've done open source at my past companies like with, okay. with the consumer VPN we were doing a ton of stuff on just like improving network communication and we were open sourcing that. Um, I think, I mean, any student of the internet in kind of computer software knows that you know it's built on the backs of a lot of open source, right? And so if, if people weren't able to leverage open source, then we wouldn't be half half as far as we are right now. Uh, I think I, I don't have enough experience as a, so like if we were to then say with humanity, oh, we're gonna so start open sourcing some of our code. I don't have as much experience to kind of give great advice on that. What I would say is that as humanity, we're, we're very happy to be able to, in, you know, kind of interact with an open source community and kind of anything that we're doing together gets published into the open source. and. And so us trying to bring everybody to a specific project that humanity is doing, it's not in our near roadmap, but us interacting with open minds and, and then in that interaction, mm. actually improving. And, and it, when you have these things, as you know, with open mind, uh, you know, you need real, real world use cases, like, like with any yeah. development, not even open source or not open source, you need real use use case, or you can end up kind of going in a certain direction that might not be as usable. Uh, so that's that's what we hope to do with humanity is actually be quite quite useful in being the, uh, one of the use cases and kind of using the stuff that open mind is doing and then in the course of that enriching uh, enriching the open source by anything that's developed in, in unison so. oh, that makes sense you know I think um, just before we started uh, this conversation here uh, when the three of us got on the call we were talking about how um, you know, certain technologies might be even more applicable in the near term. Uh, you know, some of the constructs, uh, maybe differential privacy, maybe some other constructs. I was curious if either of you had any thoughts on, on, on that or, or, or wanted to share, share kind of your vision in terms of uh, privacy constructs that, that might roll out in the future uh, as it relates to, to your own startups. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, maybe I, I can speak for, for hospitals at least. Um, Many hospitals want to want to collaborate together, and uh, that's a big thing. You know, like if you're working on on rare diseases, on any project, you just need tons of data. And um, and some hospitals know know each other. It's just complicated to find a good way to collaborate together. And that's uh, that's where uh, learning helps a lot because what yeah. you say is like you you define like a model and you you ship it on all the hospitals to be uh, trained and engaged and retrained and, and so on. And, and that's, that's a perfect use case. So of course you need the data to be standard across all of the hospitals, but that's, that's our job. So that's okay. But, uh, but, but then it makes a, it makes it very convenient for, for, for the hospital. And that's, uh, I would say it's the more, the, the, the most mature uh, technology so far uh, amongst all the privacy preserving uh, technologies uh, and and maybe the one that I would combine with is differential privacy. Um, there is like a huge uh, um, huge breakthroughs in differential privacy to try to make uh, some models that are trained uh, non-sensitive with respect to the patient that they were trained on. So um, that that is a good combination with further learning to be able to the data stays local in the centers on the centers. And the model is not sensitive, thanks to uh, the, the protection uh, of uh, different privacy. Michael, I really enjoyed this conversation and, um, and uh, just look forward to staying in touch and working and, and, uh, and hope others get benefit from this talk. Cool. Yeah, well, thanks, Sajid. Thanks, 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 Dave. Talking to you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Have a great day. Bye.
Hi everyone, I'm Fatima and I'm a PhD student at UC San Diego and a research scientist with OpenMind. And I'm going to talk about privacy preserving natural language processing, which focus on machine learning and deep learning applications. In this talk, I will first describe some of the many applications of natural language processing in our everyday lives. And then I will briefly go over the machine learning in NLP pipeline the privacy threats and the existing mitigations. I will then conclude the talk with the main takeaways. The ultimate objective of natural language processing is to read, decipher, understand, and make sense of the human language. Some of its applications in our daily lives are translation, help with planning tasks, fake news and error detection, email classification, and completion. NLP can be used for parsing medical records and predicting diseases or going through texts and journals and analyzing the sentiments. Now we will discuss the pipeline of applying machine learning algorithms for NLP. First, user data is collected. Then this data is used to train a machine learning model, for example, a deep learning language model. Once the model is trained, it is deployed on the cloud with remote access or locally on the user device. It could be used for different purposes, such as text generation, text understanding, or to create embeddings. Now, what are the possible vulnerabilities and threats in this model? One is if we assume we have a rogue data scientist who has access to the training process. In this case, the data scientist could mount a gradient attack and try to infer personal information from the updates to the model. Or they could attack the trained model or the embeddings and try to extract information from them. Another threat is an external adversary who could query the model to extract private information about the data contributors. Word and sentence embeddings can be used to infer data related to the contributors as well. Embeddings are a type of real valued vector representations that allow words with similar meanings to have similar representations. We can learn embeddings by training an embedding model, let's call it phi. We then feed sensitive information x star to phi and get the embeddings for that input. This embedding can be used for response generation, question answering, and text classification. There are three sets of attacks that can be mounted on this embedding. One is embedding inversion in which the attacker tries to invert the embedding and find the actual sequence x star. The other is attribute inference in which the attacker tries to infer attributes about x star and the last one is membership inference, where the attacker tries to infer if X star or its uh, context uh, X prime have been used for the training of the embedding model. Now let's assume that we have a text generation model and it's trained on private data. Then this sensitive information can be memorized in the model and it can be infer inferred from the model's output. For example, if a text generation model has memorized the credit card number of one of the data contributors, a user of the model might be able to extract this by writing a sentence such as, my credit card number is, and then pressing tap, 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 and then wait for the autocomplete to do its magic. In order to measure this unintended memorization in text generation models, Carlini et al. proposed the exposure metric, which answers the question, what information about an inserted canary is gained by access to the model? To measure this metric, random canaries are inserted in the training data of the language model. The canaries are strings of random tokens. Once the model is trained, the probability that is assigned to different sequences and different possible canaries is measured by feeding them to the model. Here, for instance, we see that if the ca actual canary is 2822, the smallest negative log probability is assigned to this sequence, which is indicated that it has the highest probability. This probability is used to rank different canaries, and then the exposure for each canary is calculated based on the ranking of different possible canaries. The higher the exposure, the easier it is to extract the secret or the secret canary. Now that we have seen some of the existing threats, we will briefly discuss the existing mitigations to help protect against these threats. To do so, I will first brush up on the notions of differential privacy and geo-indistinguishability. Let's assume we train a model using a medical data set that includes Alice's medical records. Now, we train another model without Alice's data. If we want to achieve differential privacy, we should be able to guarantee that the outputs of these two models 
for any possible set of inputs is very similar. To say it more concretely, a randomized algorithm A satisfies epsilon differential privacy if for all neighboring data sets, D and D prime, and all possible outputs by the ratio of the probability of seeing output Y would be bounded by E to the power of epsilon. Let's say that we're in Manhattan and we want to find nearby restaurants, but we do not want to share our actual location. In this scenario, if we use differential privacy with a low epsilon, which means a good level of privacy, the probability that our location is reported to be somewhere in New Jersey is similar to the probability of our location being reported as it, what it actually is. However, what we want to report here is the actual city that we are in, and we just need to obfuscate our location within the neighborhood. So what this means is that we want more obfuscation in a smaller radius around us, and we want less obfuscation as we go further for a bigger radius. This is what geo-indistinguishability provides. As the inequality here shows, we can see that the ratio of the probabilities is bounded by e to the power of epsilon times the distance between the neighboring data sets. This means that we can impose the level of granularity that we want using the distance metric, and we can achieve this relative measure. Now, the notion of during distinguishability is used in a recent work in the context of word embeddings. In this work, the word embeddings are perturbed with noise, uh, with, noise sam uh, with noise sampled from an exponential distribution. This distribution is calibrated such that the perturbed representations are more likely to be words with similar meanings rather than any arbitrary word from the vocabulary. For example, here you can see that for words encryption, hockey, and spacecraft, the perturbed embeddings and the perturbed words that we get if we want to have a high privacy is going to be public key futsal aerojet, and for the lowest privacy, it's encrypt hockey spacewalk. So what we see is that the words for encryption, they are not something out of the domain. It's not like tennis ball, or for hockey, it's like futsal, lacrosse, they're all sports, they're all from the same family. So during distinguishability is used to make sure that our perturbations are within the radius that we want them to be, and they're not going to map words to random unrelated words. Now, here if you're going to see a privacy mitigation for the training of recurrent neural networks, and one application of this is in natural language generation and translation. In this method, which is a mixture of federated learning and differentially private deep learning, each user trains a separate model on their own devices with their own data. During the training, the gradients for the, uh, for the model, individual models are clipped, and then the updates are applied. After a number of iterations, these updates are aggregated and then they are sent to the cloud where they are added and then noise is added to them. And the final update is generated for which the central, uh, which updates the central model. Now, once the central model has been updated, it's sent back to all the devices where they continue their training on the user data. In this scheme, since each user is training, their own model and the updates are clipped for each user, user level privacy is achieved as opposed to private work, DPSGD, which targeted example level privacy. There are other mitigations as well, which mainly target sensor data privacy, but can be extended and used for NLP tasks as well due to the sequential nature of the data. Because of lack of time, I will only share your names with you in a paper list, and then you can read them if you want yourself. Here, I've only brought Olympus, which is a method that uses adversarial learning to protect sensor data. There are also works that use uh, encoders and decoders to decrease uh, the amount of information. And I encourage you to also have a look at them. To conclude, I want to emphasize how important natural language processing is, and how we use NLP services a lot every day when we're texting, when we're writing emails. And these services are all accessing our private data. So it's very important to make sure that we have safe and trustworthy deployment of them. However, this area is heavily underexplored and there's definitely a lot of room for improvement, both in the sense of the attacks that exist and uh, for the mitigations. Thank you everyone for listening to my talk and feel free to reach me on Slack and also email me if you have any questions or any feedback that you want to provide. Thank you very much.
Hello everyone, we are now going to talk about projects that bring together several open mind contributors. The PGTPFL demo project, where we, this title is full of corners of aquanism, is not very explicit about the content of the project. In such a world, our project is to work on a proof of concept where the use of differential privacy associated with federated learning could enable the development of a model that respects both patient data privacy and the data sovereignty of healthcare. For this proof of concept, we therefore have to choose a use case, and here's how it can be stated. An hospital would like to have an estimate of the length of stay for each new patient admission. In fact, about 10 hospitals have the intuition that the data from previous hospitalization could be used to develop a model that would make it possible to predict the length of stay, especially if the model could learn from the data of ill all these hospitals. Unfortunately, hospitals have some constraint, and we cannot do that. They don't want the data to go outside of their premises, and they would like to have a guarantee that the model has learned a general trend and not a specific data from a few patients. Indeed, patients' data are very, very confidential. Several excellent studies have already shown that classically trained machine learning models can perform well on this type of predicting level of state. In order to carry out our project, we have chosen to represent the results of one of these previous work in order to have reference results to which we can compare ourselves. For this baseline, we wanted that the medical data could be accessible by all our contributors to have a simple neural network, no LSEM, no CNN, for example, as a first step. With regard to the data, the MIT lab for computational physiology made an openly available dataset comprising the identified health data associated with about 600 intensive care unit admission, including demographic, data design, laboratory tests, medication, and more. If you are interested, you can find a lot of additional details on this database called as you can guess, we will use data for the MIMIC3 database, but no, all of it. As for the model itself, we have focused on the model proposed in this paper. As you can see, this paper is a benchmark, so it proposes much more than the model we have chosen. We want to reproduce the fit front network architecture on the database, which is an extract from the MIMIC3, which I call feature seed C. As you can see, there is a very strong motivation behind uh, distributed learning. There is, a high, there is a large number of requirements, such as data has to stay private, the model has to have a high utility, potentially institutional anonymity, standardized learning setting, etc. However, as you see from this slide, when we meet the reality, it's very difficult to obtain those, uh, primarily due to the fact that increasing the utility of the model can come at the cost of user privacy and vice versa. Uh, consequently, those, those two are very difficult to balance out, which is what this project is all about. The existing solution to the distributed learning is just using a centralized server where the data is sent to the aggregate server. All the training is done there. The model is then distributed back to the uh, clients. While there is a, a slight downside of using this approach, which is using too much data and having to send all this data to and from uh, the central server, the main issue is there is no guarantee of privacy which is why we decided to make use of the second approach, which is called federated learning. This method is designed to train a collaborative uh, learning model without sharing the data with all other clients in the central server in, in a setting where the aggregation server is primarily used as an aggregator, not as a learning node. We train the model on the local data. So the uh, central model is generated and distributed across all three clients in this case. Then they compute their own model update and they share it back with the central server where the model updates, so not the individual data points, are aggregated. The reason we think that this approach is much more suitable for our learning task is because, firstly, we only share model updates, not the individual data points. Secondly, it allows us to apply multiple um, privacy preserving techniques on top of using federated learning. Now that we got an idea of how distributed training is achieved using federated learning, we take a look at how to preserve the privacy of the hospital data using a technique known as differential privacy. Differential privacy is a smart way of adding random noise to highly sensitive user data to make it more accessible to applications while ensuring the privacy of the users at the ease of computation and minimal loss of utility. So as you see in the graph on the right side, 
It is a way of ensuring that we get the same big picture. At the same time, we're able to mask individual contributions. So the question is, how is DP achieved? We add random noise, which is sampled from a noise distribution, such as a Gaussian or a Laplacian distribution. And the shape and size of that distribution is determined by two factors, the privacy budget and the query sensitivity. So now we look at the application that we're interested in, that is deep learning. Deep learning is a way where we take input data from users and we apply a neural network recipe for prediction on top of it. And this recipe includes multiple important factors, such as a model, which consists of its architecture and weights, a chosen loss function over which we try to minimize the loss value using some sort of optimizer. And our goal is that the network doesn't memorize the data. It should be able to generalize over the data. So now when we want to add noise to this pipeline to make it differentially private, the question is, where do we add it? We could be adding it to the input data. We could be adding it to the weights of the model that we're training. We could be adding it to the loss function, or we could be adding it to the step of the optimizer. So let us look at a simple algorithm called differentially private stochastic gradient descent, which is a variant of stochastic gradient descent. So SGD is a simple optimization protocol where we divide the data into small batches known as mini batches. We average the uh, loss gradient that's computed over the entire batch. And then we update the model using this average loss gradient. And we do so by taking a step in a direction that's opposite to the direction of the largest gradient. So now, if we have to look at a differentially private version of this optimization, the few changes that are going to be introduced is the first one is that when uh, we are created many batches, we will be clipping the L2 norm of those loss gradients before we average them. And after we average them, we would be adding Gaussian noise to be able to protect the privacy of the users. And finally, the update step would be the same, except that now the step taken would be in a direction opposite of the average noisy gradient. Using this, we are able to make the entire deep learning pipeline differentially private. Now that we got an idea of federated learning and differential privacy, let's talk about how we can combine these two mechanisms to the existing PySafe library. Our problem formulation has three steps. First, we build a deep learning model with DP guarantees that predicts the length of stay for each hospital admission. Next, we apply this model to predict the length of stay of a patient based on clinical data. And finally, we add a new tensor in PySift that supports DPSGD embedded in an FL scheme inside PySift. Our proposed methodology has two major steps. First is data preprocessing. As mentioned earlier, we are using MIMIC3 dataset which is a large single center dataset containing clinical information of patients admitted to critical care units. We go through some preprocessing steps as discussed in the paper by Sanjay et al. and finally obtain the feature set C, which is a process subset of the original dataset. Next, we do some model implementation. At this stage, we implement three different models. First, we implement a simple baseline neural network without DP and FL. Next, we implement a simple network with DP mechanism. And finally, we implement a simple network with federated learning. At the final stage, we embed the DP mechanism to the federated learning based neural network through secure aggregation scheme. Now, let's talk about how we can complexify the use case and develop necessary additional features. So our additional features include implementing dropout, batch norm, early stopping from a DP standpoint. Next, the use of a deeper network in order to analyze a potential correlation between the number of hyperparameters and corresponding model performance. Also, the use of more complex neural networks such as LSTM, CNN, etc. We can also analyze the impact of adding different DP noises to data. And finally, we can check the, how the model performance is going if we replace the trusted aggregator with a non-trusted one. Finally, I would like to thank all the collaborators from OpenMind who have been directly and indirectly helping in this project. You can contact us directly through openmind.slack.com for any questions and feedback. Thank you. Hello everyone.
everyone. Thank you for joining me at Pricon. My name is Maddie Shea, and I lead the Rexus team at OpenMind. We're going to build and launch an AI-powered website that learns and optimizes its own UX over time. So the use case is actually fairly common. Um, I'm a dev. I build a thing. I think it's the next big thing. And of course, there's nothing else to do but to put up a sign-up page and let everyone know and get everyone to sign up and use it. So the question is, what is the best UI to maximize user sign-up? Uh, maybe at this point, your UX team comes to you and say, hey, uh, here's the list of all the options. We're very sure one of these combinations will have a very high click-through. The other is not so, so much, but we don't know which option it is. At this point, you multiply out all the options, and you're like, OK, there's 24 possibilities. And you're experiencing the curse of dimensionality. At this point, the immediate instinct might be to say, OK, let's do A-B testing. And that is a, a good solution. However, A-B testing could get very expensive. Consider this. You want to serve enough uh, users to each options to get statistical significance. And usually, this is, this is in the order of thousands or hundreds. But let's say in our case, we want to essentially uh, funnel 10 users to each option, each of the uh, 24 options. And because only one of the options is optimal and the other ones kind of are not, um, what that means is only 10 users gets the best option, and then 20, uh, 230 of them got a suboptimal sub -optimal experience. Um, this doesn't sound so bad, but when you consider how costly it could be to acquire each user in the real world, and also how costly it could be to uh, lose the potential uh, revenue, uh, in the case of, uh, let's say, you're a large popular e-commerce company, the cost of each uh, user over their lifetime could be in the thousands. This uh, kind, kind of gets uh, pretty costly. So we would like a better option to do this. And we actually do. And the way we're going to do it is using a very simple version of reinforcement learning in the browser. We're going to make an algorithm that learns from user interactions. Here's how that might look. So over here, uh, you you know go to a sign-up page. And so far, so good. It looks pretty normal. Uh, maybe you click sign up. Maybe you don't. And then maybe you go to the website again, or the next user goes to the same website on their own browser, immediately you notice something interesting, and that is the layout has changed. So let's take a look at what's actually causing this in the background. So what's happening here is that uh, the browser is actually running SIFJS, which is our federated learning library for the browser. What it's doing is that it's downloading a model from the central PyGrid server, and it's essentially uh, learning from user interactions. For example, if I you know, land on a page that's not colorful, I don't want to sign up, I can say no, and this reports a negative update. And if I land on a page, and hopefully it's colorful, um, we can click on it, and that's a positive update. So far, so good. So let's take a look at how the mass actually works and why this is a good idea. So we're modeling the clicks rate of each UI option as a Bernoulli random variable, and we're going to initialize it with uninformed data priors. What this looks like is that initially, everything is just a flat line. It's not very different because we haven't interacted with enough users to learn anything yet. This is also why when we're initially uh, using this model, it's going to be fairly random. It will show, show you different layouts. But the question is, what happens after we're able to learn from uh, 100 or 200 users? Do we actually learn preference? And here, we set up an experiment where we initialize a vector of random uh, numbers to, rep to represent user preferences. The only thing we're going to do is randomly select one of them and set this as the optimal option. So let's see what this looks like. So as you can see, we start with uh, you know uninformed data priors. And very quickly, we're starting to figure out, hey, one of these options is definitively better than the others. So let's see that again. This is how it looks. So far, so good. So at this point, what you would expect is that if you go back to the browser, it's going to start to serve you the best option, uh, and it will be acting less randomly. So let's take a look. So, yep, it seems to have converged. Once in a while, it will still um, you know, serve a random option to explore and uh, update itself. So the benefit of using such an algorithm is that um, it's able to essentially adjust itself to user preference updates. So let's take a look at how this looks. So we're essentially simulating a user preference change. And we're going to run this again. So now observe uh, how we're able to very quickly pick out that uh, user preferences have changed. And just one more point to add. Um, this is also an algorithm that is very amenable for adding options. Let's say your design team comes to you and say, hey, uh, we actually have a 25th option that we think will be even better. What you could do is optimistically assume the 25th option, which you currently have no information on, is just as good as your most favorable option. And if it is not, it will quickly, uh, you know, the algorithm will quickly learn that it is not a favorable option and it will not be served. So these are some of the benefits of using uh, this kind of algorithm. The last thing I want to point out to you is that how simple and how compact the update is. In fact, um, I can show you the essentially the update, and that is all the code we need. We're essentially just doing vector addition and subtractions. So that is very attractive. 
Um, once again, we're learning from user actions. We're doing an update based on beta benuity controversy. This is nothing more than the mathematical nicety that makes the update very simple to compute. And we're going to essentially use Thompson sampling, which has been empirically shown to minimize regret opportunity cost uh, in a 2011 US paper. Subsequently, I, I, it's also being theoretically uh, proven to have optimal bounds for uh, discrete optimization. So in conclusion, we did end up succeeding in building and launching an AI-powered website that learns and optimizes UX over time. And I guess the key takeaway at this point is that if you're wondering if you can use open mind libraries to build production products, um, the answer is yes, yes, you can. In fact, you can use the same algorithm to optimize your own website right now. So let's switch gear a little bit and talk about privacy and what that means for recommender systems. So the Rexus team was founded based on this demo and the key hypothesis. And that is privacy is something that will really enable recommender systems to most of humanities and also improve uh, company revenue. And here's how that will probably work. So imagine if you're able to provide differential privacy guarantees and only learn from private data that stays on the user's device. What this means is that companies will have ability to serve what people really want by understanding their customers better because consumers are more willing to share private data when they understand that this data will, will be private. It, this will probably lead to better innovation, uh, increased revenue, and lower friction in marketplaces and communities. And what this also means is that we get to potentially optimize for more things than just click-through. Uh, for example, individual or societal well-being. How would you do that right now? You can't really. Uh, imagine if you're trying to optimize for someone's well-being, you may need to know information about their biometrics, for example, their uh, cortisol hormone levels, or you might want to know about their uh, you know, deepest fears and anxiety if you're trying to help them in a mental health kind of setting. Right now, uh, consumers have concerns about how this, inf how this information is being used and how it could lead to harm. Uh, in a more practical example, imagine if you're trying to understand how much people are uh, tipping their drivers when they get takeout, because we all do a lot of that, and uh, you want to essentially send out a survey. People are more likely to inflate how much they actually tip, uh, so you're not going to potentially get real data, and your data will be biased. But imagine if you tell the users, hey, listen, we're uh, sometimes going to randomly just generate a number, and therefore we don't know if the number you told us is randomly generated or your actual value. So please go ahead and provide your real value. No one will find out how much you tip or if you're tipping too low, et cetera. Uh, this, is, this is just a very simple example of how we can uh, use differential privacy to get better data. Another more um, interesting use case uh, is something like, let's say you're building an organization that's trying to help underserved migrants uh, or undocumented migrants, and you want to send them a questionnaire and have them answer. There will be a lot of concern and anxiety over what happens if they, this data gets leaked or gets uh, you know, subpoenaed, right? So you can imagine an argument where you say, hey, um, uh, there's actually no validity in this data, and even if you wanted to get access to this data, it will not help you because even though the data we gather is accurate in, in aggregate and helps us help uh, individuals, none of these individuals uh, could like might have answered honestly. For example, if someone indicated that they're undocumented, this could actually just be a factor of the browser. Here's how that would look like. So going back to the browser, there's actually a secret feature that I haven't shown you yet. And here, what we're doing is actually setting the differential privacy uh, level or differential privacy rate. So watch what happens. With the rate of 0.9, if you refresh again, it will automatically report a diff. As in, this is just the, uh, uh, this is just the data sampled from the posterior rate that we have learned. And by doing so, it does not actually hurt the model, but it provides some level of possible deniability. So let's change this back to 0.1. And maybe this user has less preference for privacy. Um, this is now waiting for user input. So what this means is that you can either provide an update based on the posterior distribution that we have learned, which doesn't hurt the model, or provides a uh, plausible deniability and de-anonymizes de the user in a way, or you could actually be uh, you know, learning from user updates and et cetera. So coming back to this, um, this is why we formed Open Mind Rexus. We want to build a future that has a equitable alternative to, to surveillance capital. Uh, and the way we're doing that is we're building open source tools and libraries for rapid experimentation for researchers. We're building these tools for ourselves because we're doing research and we want to open source them to make it available for everyone. We want to enable rapid deployments to the real world uh, because you know, learning from simulated data is great, but the real world also has, always has surprises for us. And lastly, we want to empower engineers, companies to build products with differential privacy by default. All they have to do is download an import a library and they don't need to go get a PhD or hire a whole research team. So current efforts include research, engineering, and products. Finally, I want to provide a call to action. Um, if you're human, please consider if your data is being used fairly and to your benefit. And if you're not sure, ask questions. This is how you enforce accountability. Um, if you're a company, let's collaborate. Please bring your use case, use our libraries, and let's build better privacy preserving products together. And if you're a developer or researcher, we need you. Let's join forces. Thank you.
Hey everyone, I'm Suha. I'm an undergrad CS major at Georgia Tech and a security engineering intern at Trail of Bits. During my internship, I worked on Privacy Raven, a comprehensive privacy testing suite for deep learning, optimized for usability, efficiency, and flexibility. Essentially, I built a Python library that allows users to simulate privacy attacks on any deep learning system. So your first question might be, what do privacy attacks on deep learning even look like? Imagine that you're tasked with securing this medical diagnosis system here on the right. As you can see in this diagram, users determine if a patient has a brain bleed by sending in an image and receiving a yes or a no answer. The users are given as little access to the deep learning model as possible. Therefore, one may be inclined to believe that there's not much an adversary can actually learn about this system. Let's see what an adversary simulated by Privacy Raven is capable of, even when strongly restricted. So the adversary first launched a model extraction attack to create a knockoff, stealing the intellectual property of the model. They were also able to reconstruct images from and even re-identify patients inside of the training dataset through what is known as a model inversion and a membership inference attack respectively. They were able to do this when only receiving a simple yes or a no from the system, and they used less than 15 lines of Python for each attack. I'll cover these classes of attacks one by one later, but most importantly, you just found some major confidentiality violations within the system. Presently, the attacks provided by Privacy Raven use the strongest possible threat model. In other words, the adversary only receives labels from an API that queries the deep learning model. This is known as a label-only black box threat model. A weaker threat model would be white box access, where the adversary can access information about the target, like model parameters or loss gradients. Some black box attacks also assume that the adversary receives full confidence predictions. But by operating in the most restrictive setting for an adversary, Privacy Raven can analyze the worst case scenarios. This tool is designed to be used by a wide range of people. This could potentially include a security engineer analyzing the susceptibility of their bot detection software to privacy attacks, a machine learning researcher evaluating different types of privacy preserving machine learning techniques, or developing novel privacy metrics and attacks, or a privacy researcher building an auditing tool for data provenance by repurposing membership inference attacks. First, let's look at model extraction attacks. Model extraction is what enabled the simulated adversary to create a knockoff version of the target. This is formally known as extracting a substitute model. The motivations behind model extraction tend to fall into two categories. Adversaries that launch attacks optimizing for high accuracy are usually financially motivated. Having a substitute model means that they can avoid paying for the target in the future and they can profit off of their own version. Meanwhile, adversaries optimizing for high fidelity want to learn more about the target. The substitute model extracted using this attack allows the adversary to then launch other classes of attacks, such as adversarial patches or model inversion. The different methods of model extraction found in the literature sometimes take wildly disparate approaches, which leads to other tools and implementations treating each extraction attack distinctly. Instead, while building Privacy Raven, I partitioned model extraction into multiple phases that encompass most attacks found in the literature, notably excluding cryptanalytic extraction approaches. The diagram shown here is a very high level overview. The repository contains a much more fine grained analysis if you're interested. So first, some synthetic data is generated. Then a preliminary substitute model is trained upon that data set. Next, the model is optionally retrained using a subset sampling strategy for performance optimization. This modular approach means that users can quickly switch between different synthesizers, sampling strategies, and other features without being limited to configurations that have already been tested and presented. For example, a user can easily combine a synthesizer found in one paper on extraction attacks with a subset sampling strategy found in yet another. Here is how you would launch a model extraction attack in Privacy Raven in less than 15 lines of code. So in the first part of this example, a query function is created for a PyTorch Lightning model included within the library. This part will vary depending on the structure of the system in question. The victim model here is a standard fully connected neural net trained on MNIST. Next, the eMNIST or the extended MNIST dataset is obtained in order to see the attack. The bulk of the attacks contained within this final portion. Notice that since the only requirement from the model is a query function, 
Privacy Raven can be used to attack almost any deep learning system, no matter what it was originally written in and how it is currently being distributed. Here, the knockoff synthesizer is being used to train the ImageNet transfer learning classifier. The other classes of attacks can be launched in a very similar fashion. The interface shown here is known as the core attack interface. Privacy Raven also provides wrappers around specific attack configurations found in literature and a run all attacks feature. This means that users can choose to automate much of the internal mechanics or directly control it when necessary, based upon their use case and familiarity within the domain in question. So the output of this attack would take at least 10 minutes to generate. Instead of showing you the whole output, I'll explain what's contained inside of it. First, Privacy Raven would show you statistics about the target model. Then it would provide details about the synthetic data set and the resulting substitute model, including training progress and efficiency metrics. Finally, it would display measurements for the accuracy and fidelity of the substitute model, and in turn, the model extraction attack. Now, let's learn about our second class of attacks, membership inference. Going back to the example of the medical diagnosis system, the creation of that software rely upon many patients being willing to trust the developers with their private medical data. If a patient's participation and in conjunction with that, their image and diagnosis could be recovered, it would, first of all, violate HIPAA, and then it would diminish the trustworthiness of the whole enterprise. Membership inference attacks at their core are re-identification attacks that achieve precisely that. As with model extraction, I adopted a phase-based approach of which a high-level version is displayed on the right. Before I delve into the framework, I'd like to note that Privacy Raven is one of the first implementations of these attacks under the defined threat model, which is specified in the paper shown on the left. The bulk of the attacks performed by what is known as an attack network, a binary classifier that determines whether or not a data point is inside of the target training data set. So the data set for that model comes from combining robustness calculations serving as a proxy for confidence with the outputs of a substitute model generated from a model extraction attack. It's important to note that unlike other tools, Privacy Raven integrates the extraction API, making it much easier to optimize the first phase to achieve better performing attacks and ultimately stronger privacy guarantees. On to our final attack, model inversion. This class of attacks is a much more nebulous area of work, which means that we couldn't adopt an all-encompassing phase-based approach. What a model inversion attack does is that it looks for a data that the target has memorized. In the medical diagnosis system, this was a reconstruction of the images the target was trained upon. The image on the right here shows the results of a model inversion attack on a facial recognition system. As with membership inference, the inversion API integrates the extraction API so users can benefit from customizable and optimizable traction once again. In the defined setting, these attacks actually function by training a neural net to act as the inverse of the original model. Technical details related to that are beyond scope, but are covered further in the repository and a couple of other places. Before I finish this talk, I want to mention some privacy Raven features that are still in incubation. By the time that you're viewing this talk, some of these may have already been released. So in addition to adding more methods for the previous classes of attacks, we're working on a new interface or metrics visualization that prioritizes clarity, as well as automated hyperparameter optimization for more coverage and stronger privacy guarantees. We're also working on the verification of differential privacy mechanisms and privacy metric calculations. More classes of attacks, including ones that specifically target federated learning and generative models, as well as property inference and side channel attacks will be incorporated into Privacy Raven in the future. Finally, we're planning on adding models that have already implemented privacy-preserving machine learning techniques. The hope is that in five years, machine learning assurance tools like Privacy Raven will be as commonly used as tools like LibFuzzer are for other software. Ideally, the majority of publicly deployed ML systems will implement privacy-preserving machine learning, and there will be much stronger defenses and mitigation for the multitude of failure modes in machine learning. Privacy Raven can be found on the Trail of Bits GitHub. It's an ongoing project, so we invite you to contribute where you can. For more information, feel free to contact me or my mentor, Jim, at these emails. Thank you all for your time.
Hello everyone, my name is Daniel Escudero and I'm going to talk to you about Primal. This is joint work with Anastas Kov and Samir Wah, and this is for the Open Mind Conference in 2020. We'd like to start by motivating the problem here. So in privacy preserving machine learning, the goal is to train or evaluate machine learning models in such a way that the privacy of the data is kept. And the good thing about this is that researchers have been looking at this for a while, at least for the last decade, in quite a huge amount. And they, um, there are many works, some of them are listed here, but of course this is way far from exhaustive. There are some works that have been looking at this, improving the state of the art, improving the protocols, the design, the timings, the communication, etc. So we have a very good and solid academic background for this task. And the good news is that on top of being an academic um, problem, it has also been considered by some institutions or organizations, such as, for example, Krypton, which is a framework, uh, Facebook is behind it. We also have Open Mind, the organization behind this um, conference, who are in charge of BICIF. And we have also Cape Privacy, the company behind TIF Encrypted. These are great frameworks that aim at taking these academic results and putting them into practice, making some interfaces such that, uh, so that in such a way that machine learning experts, machine learning practitioners can actually make use of these technologies to get secure counterparts of the methods and techniques that they use currently. So it's a great uh, state of things, and we are like seeing all the progress on this in this conference, for example. However, while doing our research and working on the things we work like, we, we saw that there are some things that are currently missing, so we saw like a chance to improve. And what we think that could be improved is that in the way that it is right now, it's a bit hard to assess what kind of protocols perform better than others. And this can be talking about, for example, the accuracy of the protocols, the timings, or the communication that they involve. And the reason for this is very natural, that you have different works made by different teams. Some of them have access to actual software developers who can do a very industry grade implementation, or sometimes you have access to better machines or, or different things that will affect all these outcomes. And this is not, of course, bad, but it's a bit hard to know, okay, this actually led to more efficiency, to something more accurate. Sometimes it's a bit hard to know this. The second thing is that it's, it's a bit hard to experiment with different models to find optimal accuracy and efficiency trade-offs. And what I mean by this is that in cryptography, we have very, a set of very different constraints than the ones you have in clear text computation. For example, floating point computation is, a, is a, no, it's not, it's not a problem at all in clear text computation. But for MPC or for crypto in general, we do care about avoiding these kind of computations. Uh, and you would like a framework or a way of playing with all these different things to see if they actually lead to good accuracy or good timings and good communication. So motivating this is why we decided to work on Primal. The name Primal stands for Private Machine Learning, and this is a Python framework that enables easy experimentation with different MPC protocols and variations to machine learning models. So let me elaborate a bit on this. We prioritize four main aspects. The first one being flexibility, like a framework allows you to load models from a wide variety of, of frameworks, of ML frameworks. We can load models from a from TensorFlow, and it's very easy to extend, I will get to this in a moment, also to PyTorch models. Also, we can very easily support different MPC protocols. We are not restricted to two-party or three-party computation, passive security, active security. We are very flexible in that regard, which is the point about comparing different protocols. Second, we are very usable. We chose Python because it's a high-level language that is very easy to understand, to read, and to use, and we leverage this in our framework. So um, using it is very easy, and in particular, it's also easy to extend it in multiple directions, which takes me to the next point. Our framework is very easy to extend to include multiple MPC protocols. Right now, we only support three-party computation using replicated secret sharing, but extending it is definitely easy to do thanks to our interface and our efforts uh, in making this usable. Finally, it's efficient. And it's, of course, not C++ efficient, because this is a high-level language that cannot achieve such efficiency. But in spite of that, we took a lot of care in implementing our framework in such a way that it is very lightweight. It uses only a few set of uh, uh, requirements, basically NumPy and SNKO for the communication. And it's also very efficient, at least as efficient as it can be, taking into account that it's written in Python. So our architecture is very simple. We have some translators that are the ones that load models from different frameworks. So we have a translator right now that loads models from TensorFlow, more concretely from TensorFlow Lite, but we can easily extend it to a translator that also reads from PyTorch. Then we have transformers that are the ones that, as the name implies, transform the model to be synergistic with Primal. So for example, it can be a, trans a transformer that takes all linear activations and turns them into matrix multiplications because these are efficient to do with some NPC protocols. Or it can take certain uh, truncations and turn them into probabilistic truncations, which are more efficient in NPC, and so on and so forth. And then we have evaluators that are the ones that actually are in charge of running the networks, of running the models. 
And this can be, for example, just a clear text evaluation, just because you want to test accuracy, for example. Or the, it can be a specific MPC protocol. It can be three party, two party, and now you can see why our protocols can be so flexible. We have a paper that explains all these concepts. Of course, we also have the implementation. Hopefully, it will be out soon so that you can check it out. And now I want to leave you to Anna Salskov, one of my co-authors, who will show you a demo of the kind of things you can do within our framework right now. Uh, thank you, Daniel. So I'm going to go over three examples that illustrate how to use this framework um, in the context of like secure inference. And the examples will essentially be how to run it, uh, how to do inference like a small MNIST net network, how to time specific parts of the network and then to do like a small modification and see the effect that this has uh, on the, the time. So the first example is just, just to see how, how you, you would use it in order to do like secure inference. Um, so we have these two files. We have like an MNIST model and we have some MNIST input, so an image. Um, to load the model, we simply call this read input uh, function and we give it the, the file name of the model and then we specify the file type. So the file type isn't super important here. Native is just to say that it's stored in some some format that is uh, like also used somehow internally in, in Prime. Then we construct a network uh, with our ID. So this is passed on the command line um, and then the um, IDs of the other parties, basically. Um, and there is no port or host name given here. So we just assume that everything is run locally, like on, on a local host. Then we construct an evaluator. Uh, in this case, it's an evaluator based on replicated secret sharing. We pass the model in the network. We load the, um, the image, which is loaded basically like the model is. And then we run everything and then we print the result. So running this, see that it takes 10 milliseconds. You run it a couple of times, it's 12, yes, 13, it's a bit seven, a lot of variation, but like that's Python for you, I guess. Okay, so next example, basically the same thing, except now we want to time the matrix multiplication layers, for example. And the way we do this is that we just construct a new evaluator um, by subclassing the replicated evaluator we used before. And then we use these decorator functions to tell the evaluator that it should call this function before a matrix multiplication and this function after a matrix multiplication. So that's essentially what these call before, call after uh, decorators do. And they're quite simple. Uh, in the call before, it just constructs like a timer object, starts this guy. And in the call after, it just stops it again, and then it prints the time. And all of this is just as before. You construct the evaluator, load the image, yada, yada, yada. So now we can run this, and we see that it's like seven milliseconds for the first one, four for the second one. And run it again, it's like four. That's like, again, there's a bit of variation, but like the idea here is to show that you know, now we get timings for only the matrix multiplication layers. All right. Um, so the last example, as I mentioned, now what we want to do is that we want to make like a small modification to the um, to the um, the way we evaluate stuff and then we want to measure the result of this so that's what this example three is and idea exactly as before we subclass uh, an evaluator in this case we subclass the timed evaluator because then we get the timings for the matrix multiplications as before and then we construct a new primitive uh, like a new mpc primitive here well it, it's the same primitives that we have already but like this is implemented in a faster way so this clamping essentially, uh, it's needed for these TF light models um, at the end of a matrix multiplication, essentially. It, it's to ensure that the output value is between zero and 255, like it's a valid byte. And this supposedly does it with like one uh, comparison set of two, um, which you get from this truncation here. Um, so let's see. Uh, and here we get into like the nitty gritty of the, the MPC underneath, like we have all of these await calls, which implies that there's some communication going on and so on. But all of this is just like computing on, on secret shared data. And the rest, of course, is as before. The only thing we change is the evaluator. So now we can run this and we see that now it's instead of like, um, yeah, nine and three, it's like five and 1.8. Instead of like, I guess, nine and three here, it's like seven or something. I mean, we can run it a couple of times and we see that it's essentially, it is slightly faster, which is like not expected because we do one less uh, comparison, basically. And that's it. That's what I wanted to talk about. Okay, so the last thing we want to address is the question, where do we think the field will be five years from now? And well, we have seen a lot of progress in the last decade. It has been almost exponential. You can see a lot of works coming up, improving the efficiency very, very rapidly. And we expect that uh, hopefully five years from now, we start seeing the first applications of these technologies. MCC, 
research assistant at the National University of Singapore. Today, I'll be presenting our tool, ML Privacy Meter, designed and developed at the NUS Data Privacy and Trustworthy Machine Learning Lab. Since the past few years, there has been a huge speculation and discussion around the privacy risks of AI. Several concerns were raised about protecting personal data in AI systems. In fact, as per Article 35 of GDPR, it is mandatory to perform a data protection impact assessment DPIA if a data processing involves innovative technologies such as machine learning. The key steps in performing a DPIA are to assess the potential threats to data and identify possible risk mitigation measures. Traditionally, when performing DPIA, organizations focused on illegitimate access to data, say through security breaches. But when we are using a machine learning model in the inference phase, we do not rely on the training data to make any predictions. Hence, at a first glance, it might seem like the data is safe because we are not even touching it to make the predictions. But machine learning models pose a subtle threat to the data by indirectly revealing about it through the model's predictions and parameters. Past work has shown that it is possible to infer about the training data just by observing the predictions of a machine learning model. In a membership inference attack, the attacker infers if a particular record was present in the training set. These attacks were tested against machine learning as a service platforms offered by both Google and Amazon, and they achieved a significantly high accuracy. Membership inference attacks can be a threat on its own when mounted against models trained on sensitive data, say medical records containing diseases such as HIV, which might carry social stigma if found out. In general, membership inference attacks can be seen as a measure of information leakage from the model and the more successful an attacker is in performing membership inference against a model, larger is the information leakage from the model about its training set. Why do these inference attacks work? Machine learning models tend to behave differently on members, that is records that are present in the training set, and non-members, that is records that are not present in the training set. An attacker with some background knowledge can learn to distinguish this behavior and infer if a particular record was present in the training set. In case of neural networks, if the entire model is revealed, the parameters and the gradients with respect to the parameters, especially in the final layers, reveal a lot of information about the training set. This brings in new challenges for data protection laws when designing AI regulatory frameworks. In fact, the European Commission, which is the executive branch of the EU, calls for adequate protection of privacy and personal data in using AI and build systems that are resistant to attacks. Similarly, the White House memo on regulating AI applications emphasizes on data protection throughout the operation of an AI system, which includes the inference phase. Recent reports published by the ICO UK on auditing AI and NIST US on securing AI applications highlight the threat to training data from machine learning models. And they specifically mention membership inference as a potential confidentiality violation and privacy threat to training data. As per the auditing framework of ICO, it is mandatory for organizations to ensure that models do not expose personal data when deployed. The internal teams at ICO will be using this framework to assess if an organization is compliant with data protection regulation laws. Hence, organizations should account for and assess the privacy risk to training data from machine learning models. But how do we measure this indirect leakage about data from complex machine learning models? Our tool, ML Privacy Meter, generates risk reports for the training data from machine learning models. It produces risk scores for all the records in the training set. These scores can be useful in identifying the fraction of records that are under high risk of being revealed to the model. Whether it is just providing query access to a model or revealing the entire model, ML Privacy Meter can readily estimate the privacy risk to training data. How does ML Privacy Meter work? ML Privacy Meter works by implementing membership inference attacks against machine learning models and is based on the state-of-the-art attack techniques. It simulates attackers with various capabilities 
and different levels of background knowledge about the training data. The attack techniques are from our recent papers and are based on the foundational works that measure information leakage from the predictions and parameters of a machine learning model. Given any data record, ML Privacy Meter automatically generates risk scores from each of our simulated attack. These scores represent the particular attacker's belief that the record was present in the training set. Larger the separation between distribution of these scores for members and non-members, the easier it is to perform membership inference attack. Success of the attacker can be measured by an ROC curve which represents the trade-off between true positive and false positive rates. False positives corresponds to identifying records that are not present in the training set as members and true positive refers to identifying the records that are present in the data set as members. A trivial strategy such as random guess can achieve equal rates of true positive and false positive rates. ML privacy meter automatically plots the ROC curves that are achieved by our simulated attackers. The area under these curves represents the success of the attack and higher the area under the curve, larger is the risk to training data. These numbers not only quantify the success of a membership inference attack, they can also be seen as a measure of information leakage from the model. Such quantification of risk from machine learning models can be very useful in performing a data protection impact assessment, DPIA. The key aim of performing a DPIA is to analyze, identify, and minimize the potential threats to data. ML Privacy Meter can help practitioners in all these three steps of performing a DPIA. It generates detailed risk reports for the training data, which help in identifying the records that are under high risk. It allows for comparison of risk across records from different classes in the training set. It also allows for comparing the additional risk due to revealing the entire model with the risk due to providing only a query access to the model. Once these risk reports are obtained, practitioners can learn to identify the source of this information leakage and choose possible mitigation measures. For example, if it's due to overfitting to the training data, they can fine tune their regularization techniques or if it's due to overfitting because of insufficient data from certain classes, they can add the appropriate data and retrain their models. Or they might even choose to learn with the proper privacy protection in place. For example, differential privacy, which is a standard notion of statistical privacy. A learning algorithm is said to satisfy differential privacy if the models that are obtained by training on a data set that differs by only one record are indistinguishable to an external attacker. The level of indistinguishability is controlled by a privacy parameter epsilon. Open source tools such as OpenDP and TensorFlow allow for training models with differential privacy guarantees. But when using these tools, selecting epsilon is a highly non-trivial task. Smaller values of epsilon ensure that we get better privacy guarantees, but it also means getting a less accurate model. Epsilon is just a worst case upper bound on the privacy risk, but it might not accurately capture the practical privacy risk for this particular data set that we are using. So how do we select a decent value of Epsilon? ML Privacy Meter can help in selecting the value of Epsilon by quantifying the practical risk at different values of Epsilon, depending on the risk tolerance level and utility expectation level, practitioners can choose the corresponding value of epsilon after quantifying the risk using ML privacy meter. Instead of relying the, on the guarantees by epsilon, using this method ensures that they deploy models with way better accuracy. Hence, by providing more utility, we expect ML privacy meter to boost the use of privacy enhancing techniques. The tool is publicly available at the GitHub link shown please do check it out and we are welcome to contributions from the open source community. So please feel free to contact us with questions and suggestions to improve the tool. Thank you.
I'm Kenneth Kukier. I'm a senior editor at The Economist, and I've written books about data. And I'm talking to you today about contact tracing and privacy and society. Now, it is a very tricky question because you would think that the world would have been able to balance both public health and individual privacy. But alas, no, that wasn't the case. We weren't able to do that. And I think it's been a real tragedy that we haven't been able to have it both ways, so to speak. So that's what I'd like to talk to you today about and to think about how we might be able to do better and start a conversation on how we might be able to do better as a society. 311 is going to be considered a very important day in history, like 9-11 was. But 311 was the day that the World Health Organization declared COVID as an officially uh, as a pandemic. And at the time, if you remember, there was actually a lot of optimism that amid the despair that we could apply the track and trace systems and testing for us to get a handle on what was going on and to fight back. And we could actually use technology first and foremost to do that. Because on a digital setting, we could do things that we couldn't otherwise do. And all you have to do is think back in history about what it would be like to have a plague in the Middle Ages where all you were able, able to do was isolate the sufferers and in effect, in effect watch them die. And then later on, the great project of the 19th century and early 20th century was about applying our reason and our organization and our thoughtfulness to actually control the situation. And the way we do that is through tracking and tracing. What we would do is we would apply, uh, simply uh, identify who has it, then their contacts who was exposed to it, and isolate them from the population. And over time, the reproductive rate of the contagion of the, of the plague of the pandemic actually subsides because fewer people are getting infected and the R naught, as we call it today, gets lower and lower until eventually we can extinguish the pandemic. And we can do that now on digital tools that are more sophisticated, like call data records, in which we can use where the phone is and make the calls that it's made and who they're contacting, but more importantly, where they are through the geolocation services and or simple triangulation, triangulation from the cell phone tower in order to identify where, the, where the, the caller is and therefore where the prevalence of the pandemic may be and may be going. This was used in a very rudimentary sense during the Ebola pandemic in West Africa uh, several years ago, in 2014, uh, but only in a rudimentary way. I and mean, you would think that in 2020, we could do it in a more sophisticated way in top tier economies. And so you would think that, but you'd think we'd be wrong actually. And the reason why, is although we have this possibility for testing, tracking, and tracing, we didn't either have the creativity and we certainly didn't have the policy and institutional framework in order to enable it. So let's first look at the first part of that uh, tracking, which is gonna be also the most controversial. And so if you just open your mind to what was possible on a, on a digital setting with the, with the handset of the mobile phone, it's pretty extraordinary. You'd be able to know, and this is just in theory, You'd be able to know first the location of a person. You'd also be able to know their movements. You would know not just their movements, but others in their vicinity. You'd have their address books, so you'd know who their contacts are. And you would know the duration of any interaction with people, and also even the type of interaction. Are they on a train together? Or are they in a car? Because you'd know where they're going. You'd see that they're, they're going at a certain speed. You'd know uh, that, in, that interaction uh, they could have been walking or or together. These are the sorts of things, or maybe they could actually have the phones could have been in the same vicinity, the same apartment overnight, suggesting that they may have stayed uh, in the same vicinity that evening together. These are the sorts of things that are possible to know on a uh, track and trace system. You would even know, in fact, if it's the first time those two phones have been in the same apartment together. Uh, and there's a reason why society didn't actually implement all of the bounty of digital possibilities using data. And it's because of this. It's because that when similar situations in the past were put forward where data could be applied in the most ugliest of ways, it was. And this is Marseille. 
uh, in France. This is uh, the year 1943. And this is the roundup of the Jews of Marseille in 1943. Uh, you can see children uh, in the foreground of the image. Uh, and there you'll see a boy who's about probably about 10 years old and another one next to a mother who's about seven. And my father was a five hour car ride away from there in Montluçon and he was about seven. So I feel skin in the game about this issue. I'm animated about it. Uh, the countries that had the most complete civil records also had the worst atrocities uh, in terms of the roundup and extermination of Jews suggesting a link between the richness of the data and it being used for the most blood-soaked ends. So we have to be very careful about how we look at this and realize that it also isn't this historical artifact of Nazis in Europe, uh, America on a very, very, very different uh, level, extraordinarily different level, still nevertheless, use data for their purposes, which they felt was legitimate at the time for the internment of the Japanese. And we can't even think that this is somehow lost into the sands of time into the past. It's only a century ago, which our great grandparents uh, are, you know, fight, not ours, because it was in our own living memory just 25 years ago that the data um, and civil records of a country were used to kill other people, in this case in Rwanda. Now, if that's the tracking part of it. That's the potential that we have. The tracing actually is interesting and sort of almost answers that because we can, on a digital setting, we could actually use the technology to render all this data anonymous, to make all this data private, and we can have these automated notifications so that you would think that you don't even need sort of a central authority. Uh, you do need a central authority in certain choke points. But in other domains, you don't to actually run the system and to actually enable it to work, as opposed to a century ago in which you had contact tracers, or even today, human beings calling people using ledgers, identifying it and writing things down and being able to look at it with their eyes and communicate it to other people. It gets even more interesting and also maybe horrific as well, depending on your state of mind, if you think about the T, the first T, the testing part of it, with this, with the data that we have, we could actually test some of our assumptions, not just have the testing data that people would upload into the app or that we can infer whether they have COVID or not. And we could learn new information about the spread of the pandemic. So for example, we have this rule, the two meter rule, that if you're farther than two meters, you're probably safe and you're within two meters, you shouldn't be. Well, how do we know that? Well, we have some studies, but they're not very robust studies. We could actually test that if we understood who had COVID and who didn't, and then who came down with COVID later, and the vicinities of their cell phones. We could learn new things. 15 minutes of exposure, the notification, exposure notification apps rely on 15 minutes of contact. Why isn't it 10? Why isn't it 20? Well, that's an assumption that we've built in. There is a little bit of science behind it, but not a whole lot. And if we actually could use the data, we could learn new things about the spread of the disease that would actually help us. It gets even trickier and maybe a little bit more questionable when you think about other things that we could do. So for example, if someone's cell phone use dramatically changes, that either they're not answering the phone, the phone as long in as, as quickly as they used to, the conversations are far shorter than ever before, that they're not actually scrolling in quite the same way, but looking at things maybe just for the time and that's it, that maybe there's been an, an inter, a variable that's intervened, maybe they're ill and we might be able to infer that this is a telltale pattern of illness. There has been research at MIT several years ago that did show for the common flu that there was changes in the pattern of cell phone usage that was a telltale that the person was coming down with and then subsequently was infected with the seasonal flu. Could get even more spooky when the person is talking, if they have the dry cough, we would be able to, an algorithm could pick that up fairly easily. In fact, we could, as we know uh, from the Snowden disclosures, we can even activate the microphone without the, without the person knowing. And we could actually listen into conversations a little bit like Alexa or just simply use Alexa if we wanted to through that means and know if someone had a dry cough and know and therefore infer whether they, uh, they had COVID or not. Uh, and again, this is possible. We can use data this way and we're not using data this way. And the reason why is that we feel that this is a abuse of power from the country, from the state 
to the citizen and that we should be wary of it. And we have legitimate reasons to be wary of it. There are times when the state has done incredibly heinous things uh, that we have to be open-eyed about and recognize that that's in our nature and it's possible and we have laws to govern against it and they're imperfect. Now, this is also maybe in some domains, for some people, this is very, um, if you're in a developing country and an embryonic democracy, this is a very real problem. If you're in, an, in, in a Western country with the rule of law, it's less of a real problem. And I'm gonna bring this up in a moment. But it, amid testing and track and trace, we also have technology. And most of you at the conference uh, for the next two days have been thinking simply about that uh, and because you're coders and developers and technologists, and that's what your expertise is. And so all of these technologies are abundant, and I've named a few that we can apply to this problem and are trying to, but largely haven't, because we haven't been using the technology for all that we could. And part of the reason is that the law isn't there to help us enable us to do that. We have GDPR, we've got HIPAA in the US and other countries have their own privacy legislation built generally around the OECD guidelines. But again, the testing is happening in a difficult way for most places where there's just not been enough of it. And we'll leave that aside. We're not making inferences around testing and maybe we shouldn't because that's too early a science. But the track and trace hasn't been happening either. Instead, what we have are notification apps, ex exposure notification apps that are simply letting you know if you've been in the vicinity of someone who has tested positive for COVID. And the way it works is very simple. The cell phones through Bluetooth are able to send a little messages to each other that they've, they've been in contact and then they measure how long it's been, typically 15 minutes. And then if, there is, if they've been in that proximity of each other and someone comes down with COVID, the others are automatically notified, but the data is decentralized and in fact there is no data it stays on the handset it doesn't go anywhere else and then it gets erased and the apps can be disabled uh, when the pandemic's over and can't be reused for you know, various purposes and you have to be certified in order to get the api to use it and all of these things seem very good in fact it's clearly people at apple and google that cooperated to launch this that recognized that this was such a urgent issue that they had to act that they have this infrastructure that could actually play a hugely important role, but because they know data so well, so much better than everyone else, they understood the ways which it could be misused. And so they felt that it was critical that they actually deployed this with the highest level of privacy safeguard possible. In fact, so high that, the, that it seems like they wanted to be make sure that they didn't look like they were not protecting privacy, That because if they showed as a wisp of anti-privacy, they'll be pummeled uh, by, by consumers and they'll be pummeled by the stock market. Uh, but maybe they, they were a little bit too uh, careful because a lot of countries, the rightful sovereign and legitimate leaders, feel like this has been a problem for them. And, and a person just thinking about this with an open set of eyes would say, really, like no data, these guys to the state, really? like." I don't know about this, no data. Well, let's think about what a country auto automatically has on citizens. They know your name, you need a birth certificate. They know if you have people in the family, either through the census, which is of course cordoned off or should be, um, but through other ways in which if you have a driver's license or if you have voting records, they know your home address, work and your income through the tax records. They know if you've bought property, they know if you've had any judicial problems, they know uh, your health if you have a national health service. And the companies, of course, their business model is data. So of course they know who you are, certainly your email address if they're offering you free email. They know your home and your work if you have a cell phone or your work because they know where it's staying during either business hours or, or in the evenings. Um, they often will know your spending. They'll certainly know your interests if you're Googling it. Uh, they may know who your partners are if your phones are next to each other uh, overnight. Uh, and they may know your health as well if they're tracking your steps and maybe your, your blood oxygen levels. So it's a little bit strange that these are the people who are preventing one set of people, preventing another set of people from accessing the data. Now, there's these questions that we have to ask. So first is what is the legitimacy of Silicon Valley uh, entrepreneurs, or now I guess say business executives making decisions that will affect the sovereign uh, 
countries and the leaders who feel that they want to be empowered to do all they can. And what are the interests of the organizations involved? I mean, obviously, if you're the leader of a country like Germany, your interest is in public health and public safety. That's your job. If it's if you're a a, um, a technology company, you've got other interests. Um, adherence to the rules. These companies are ones that are constantly under regulatory scrutiny for violating antitrust law and other laws. Um, yet, you know, countries themselves are constantly in, uh, you know, failing to adhere to their own rules as well. And it's hard to punish the sovereign. And then there's a strange question of, are we being hostage to the edge case? Should citizens of Britain, France, and Germany have a dumbed down exposure notification app rather than a robust track and trace app because these developers at Apple and Google were wary of Vladimir Putin? These are questions that we've not debated. There's even no forum to have that debate and hence I'm bringing it today. And of course, throughout all of these questions and this entire debate, we're forgetting the most critical element. We've strayed from it. It's a pandemic. People are dying and we've got to do everything we can to prevent other people from getting ill. And track and trace is a vital tool. Technology in general is a vital tool to enable that, to make sure we can actually save lives and prevent infections. At its core, it is a debate between individual privacy and public health. And if you look at how the exposure notification apps have been deployed, you gotta scratch your head and say, hey, surely society could have done better, right? In Germany, there's been 18 million downloads. In France, there's only been 2.4 million and at a quarter of those people uninstalled it because the app didn't work so well. By early September, there was only 200 notifications on the app that had been downloaded by two and a half million people. Uh, and in Britain, it's even worse. The app just launched on the 24th of September. That's a few days before, it's actually a day before I'm giving this presentation. Uh, and you would think that they could have organized it a little bit better. Now, um, anarchy in the UK, the British system is a, is, a, is a great way of thinking about the problems that you would face and how a lot of different interests collide. The government uh, should, should have done better. There's no excuse. Initially, they didn't say how long they were going to hold the data. Then when they finally did disclose it, they announced that it was going to be 20 years. That seems weird. I mean, they're, they're, this is data they're now not collecting, but this is what they initially wanted to do with the first version uh, last spring of a track and trace app. Oh, that just seems peculiar that you'd need it for that long. Or, and if you do, and I think actually maybe that is a reasonable thing, you have to just justify to the public why you need it for 20 years. What is the, what is the benefit? What's the value? And how are you going to protect it? Again, there may very well be legitimate reasons. I sort of think there probably are. But if you're not even able to announce it, and first you first want to fail to disclose it, well, shame on you. Like, ça va pas. We're not going to allow that as, as, as citizens. The activists have been no better. Um, uh, one group of activists, privacy activists, sued the government for what they called recklessness because th there was no risk assessment uh, that in compliance with the GDP GDPR rules that if you're gonna have a track and trace app, you need a risk assessment around what it might be. But you can understand why the government didn't have time to do a risk assessment. Again, they're fighting a pandemic and trying to launch the app. So, all they needed to do, the government, is to say, hey, we're going to delay it, and here's when we're going to actually produce the risk assessment. And they don't need to be sued or, or called reckless by privacy advocates. That's just over dramatic. Patients, you know, the, there's been problems there too. In the 14 day self isolation that patients who've come down with COVID need to comply with, only 11% have complied. And we only know that because of self reporting. But you can imagine it might be much lower than that if we had actually the data from a track and trace system, an app that could actually monitor these things. It is monitored, for example, in Taiwan with hefty, hefty penalties. There's carrots as well. They actually get something about almost about a little bit less than 100 bucks a day if they have to quarantine just for staying at home. But they get maybe, they get, I think, a thousand times that penalty up to $33,000 or so, if they, which would be about um, 30,000 pounds, um, if they actually, uh, violate what the digital fence that they're sort of put under that that's monitored all the time. The contacts uh, in Britain and in Europe, uh, typically the contacts uh, will be announced at 
uh, three to four contacts if you have COVID and you're contacted by a contact tracing person on the telephone. In Taiwan, that's 15 to 20 uh, contacts that are shared. Now, I don't think it's because the people in Europe want to be reticent in terms of what they're sharing. I mean, the people are patients and they want to protect the people who they've been in touch with. Maybe they're just not so aware of it. But whatever the reason, it does show that if you had an app, that part of the problems would go away because you'd be able to do this automatedly. And the media, don't even get me started. <laughs> so at the core of this problem is a matter of trust and institutions. And why I'm bringing it up today is end technology. And if we think about those three elements that I brought out earlier about legitimacy and interest and adherence to the rules, you have to imagine there's got to be a way that we could have a public-private partnership, that there could be stewardship and a custodianship around the data and severe penalties, that, and that together these three features answer the concerns that we have. It gets down to capabilities. We need competency, and the state has shown that, typically in the military, there's often competency there, very meritocratic structure. We need transparency, and judiciary is typically the, the agent in the government that is probably the most transparent. Not only are there rulings, but those rulings have, have to be reasoned, and there's a whole chain of review of those, of the reasoning and the ruling together. Justice is done and seen to be done. It's a principle of Western jurisprudence. Accountability, that's tougher. Who holds the sovereign to account? Honestly, it's not clear. And we're seeing the fragile nature of our democracies the more that we see populism in places where we didn't expect it, whether it's Hungary or Turkey, whether it's Britain or whether it's America. So we need to have the societal conversation and we need to talk about, uh, and I wanted to use this moment to launch this conversation, a very rigorous conversation on can we trust the technology if we can't trust the institutions that have to deploy the technology, right? It's not good enough to have homomorphic encryption if we don't think it's implemented well, if the random ge number generator is not so random because it suits someone's interest that it's not. If only the geeks understand the technology, how do we expect the public to trust it? The public's not even trusting the scientists who say wear a mask. How, how would they willingly allow all of these features of data that could be done from the cell phone if they don't think the state is going to have a bounded use of it that will preserve their freedom and their, their lives. Ultimately, it gets down to, can we use the data for public health and protect privacy at the same time? Can we have it both ways? I don't even know how we can actually move forward in this. Where is the forum for this debate? Who are the people who need to be around the table? But what is clear is that we need to have this conversation as if our life depended on it, because it probably does. Thank you. I hope this has been useful to start a fire, to start a conversation, and to get us all thinking about the ways in which we need to use data to be responsible and to think about how to interact uh, in a world in which COVID is a very real part of our life and we need to actually do all that we can to protect ourselves and our communities. I look forward to talking more about this. Thank you. Well, I hope you've enjoyed your first day at PriCon 2020, that um, you've enjoyed all the different, uh, different speakers and ideas and concepts you've been able to, to learn about and, and listen to today. Um, and even though the videos are, are ending um, um, for this first day, uh, I hope that you'll continue to kind of wander the halls of, of the conference, just like you would in any, any normal conference, and, and really get into those, into those conversations, because it's, it's really, you know, it's after the, the talks stop and, and that the conversations uh, amongst, our, amongst each other can really, really begin. Um, um, and yeah, so, so even though the videos are, are ending, like, like hop in together, hop into Slack, you know, when you're, when you're having dinner, you're like, like, Find a group of folks to have have a meal with, to, to, to share, to talk about some of the different concepts, um, and and really embrace the opportunity to to be able to speak to the privacy community um, at large here here at the conference. Um, and with that, um, I will see you tonight in in Slack and and in Gather, um, and then after after kind of these these sort of informal hangout times, I'll see you in this in the next session tomorrow morning. Ooh.